Good afternoon. The date, June 29th, 2016. I'll come back to that. On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon to West 86th Street, and if you are viewing uh, from far away, wherever you are, to this symposium marking the opening of New York on Display, 1853 New York Crystal Palace, the 14th exhibition in our Focus Exhibition Series. That's quite an accomplishment, and it leads me first off to want to thank, in particular, the director and the director of the gallery, Nina Stritzer-Levine, for their guidance over the seven or eight years where we have been producing these exhibitions uh, and the wonderful scholarly volumes that accomplish, accompany them. The Focus exhibition is uh, an initiative that's designed to, uh, on one very simple level, bring together the two buildings uh, of our campus on West 86th Street, the gallery building down the street at number 18 and the academic building here at 38. But of course, the combining goes far deeper than that. The goal lay in the initial idea of wishing to create a model of bilingualism, students and indeed also faculty capable of working as curators and asking the questions of curators to curators and to themselves, but also capable of asking the questions that professors and doctoral and master's students ask of themselves and to others around seminar tables and in their publications. And I think we can say, 14 of these under our belt, that this ambition to create a kind of uh, bilingualism or ambidextrousness has been achieved. I would say one more thing, looking at, to a still wider horizon. And that is that the exhibition gallery and indeed the process of exhibition making constitutes the laboratory setting for the humanities. We have a tradition, as you know, uh, and some of, some of us uh, enjoy it as well, a tradition of the humanist sitting in his originally lonely cell uh, with his piled up manuscripts working through the sacred texts in an attitude of devotion which eventually was secularized into the research practices of the humanities, but still very solitary. It took a long time for that solitariness to be broken open and even to be acknowledged, as it has been in the modern study of the Republic of Letters, that even the scholarship that looks solitary was never really so solitary. But it's still a long way from that to the loud, collaborative, skeptical, questioning, raucous environment of a laboratory, as we think of the natural sciences. But for students and faculty at the Bard Graduate Center, we know full well, and this is indeed the third great accomplishment uh, of the FOCUS project, that the setting of the gallery, the setting of exhibition making, bringing together scholars, curators, or professors, curators, artisanal knowledge, students, full of questioning, full of the incorporation of the tacit into the specific. And so in a way, I feel very fortunate for this institution that uh, with the centrality of the gallery, it has been able to develop its graduate training and its faculty research through the medium of the humanists' laboratory into the vital uh, and successful intellectual endeavor that it is. And so I'd like in particular just to uh, thank those uh, who are involved in making the FOCUS project work, in addition to those I've mentioned already, the director and the director of the gallery, uh, Ivan Gaskell, who is the head of the FOCUS project, from whom you'll hear in a moment, Marianne LaMonica, chief curator, uh, Caroline Hanna, who worked so closely on this exhibition, Jesse Mirandi, Ian Sullivan, and then Jeremy Johnson, Kate DeWitt, Dan Lee, and Alexis Mucha. All of these people working together with the students, from whom again you'll hear uh, very soon, 
creating this kind of a project. 19th century New York, to bring it to where we're going, the city described by Whitman, the city at hand with dwellings so dense and stacks of chimneys and all the scenes of life and the workshops and the workmen homeward returning, low body and soul, this land, my own Manhattan, with spires and the sparkling and hurrying tides and the ships. I think this is a wonderful introduction as if to the world of the Crystal Palace. Uh, in some sense, the world uh, described by Walter Benjamin in his study of 19th century Paris, of glass, of gaslight, of incipient consumerism, of social mixing, fashion, trades, all under one roof, so to speak. Uh, and that's one of the things that will make uh, this exhibition such a landmark. I began, or I should say that um, this uh, symposium uh, was scheduled a long time ago, as all uh, well-organized institutions do uh, with their uh, events of all sorts. And so that date, <coughs> uh, June 29th, 2016, um, from then to now, I have actually been dreading uh, this date because that was the day on which I heard from David that um, he was ill and it was clear that he was not likely to be here for me to introduce uh, right now. Um, we'll have an opportunity on Sunday to pay uh, proper respect uh, and celebrate his broader intellectual achievements. But I would be remiss, uh, and also a bad friend, not to say how, uh, how deeply I miss him and how much his accomplishments uh, and his intellectual vision remain speaking loudly in this exhibition. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ivan Gaspar. Good afternoon. The New York Crystal Palace was many things. A showcase of the fruits of continuing of the continuing American colonial project, a bid to join the club of imperial nations, an assertion of both Yankee ingenuity and a growing American independence from a reliance on predominantly British capital. It was also an exercise in real estate development. This has many resonances today in a city consumed by real estate development ambitions and the profits it affords. But its very possibility means asserting a right to title to the land on which such developments, all developments, take place. As we're all aware, that right to title is morally if not legally, murky at best. The building of the New, York Crystal, the New York Crystal Palace depended no less than did the building of, say, the Woolworth Building, the Empire State Building, or Trump Tower, on a morally challengeable assumption. Now, some of you will be wondering what on earth I'm talking about, though our late colleague David Jaffe knew perfectly well. And others of you will understand these claims, yet dismiss them as irrelevant to present-day realities. After all, where are the Lini Linapi today? What has become of Linipehoking, the traditional Lenape territory? But not every settler American has set aside such concerns. Just two years after the exhibition of the Industry of All Nations opened in Carl Gildemeister's spectacular building, Henry David Thoreau published the first part of his essay on Cape Cod in June 1855, an uh, issue of Putnam's Monthly. He did not subscribe uncritically to the settler myth of untrammeled claims to Indian lands. And what he wrote of Cape Cod, but it equally applies to New York, deserves to be heard. 
This is quite a long quotation from Thoreau's Cape Cod. When the committee from Plymouth had purchased the territory of Eastham of the Indians, it was demanded who laid claim to Billingsgate which was understood to be all that part of the Cape north of what they had purchased. The answer was, there was not any who owned it. Then, said the committee, that land is ours. The Indians answered that it was. This was a remarkable assertion and admission, continues Thoreau. The pilgrims appear to have regarded themselves as not any's representatives. Perhaps this was the first instance of that quiet way of speaking for a place not yet occupied, or at least not improved as much as it may be, which their descendants have practiced and are still practicing so extensively. Not any seems to have been the sole proprietor of all America before the Yankees. But history says that when the pilgrims had held the lands of Billingsgate many years, at length appeared an Indian who styled himself Lieutenant Antony, who laid claim to them, and of him they bought them. Who knows, but a Lieutenant Antony may be knocking at the door of the White House some day. At any rate... I know that if you hold a thing unjustly, there will surely be the devil to pay at last. This was one of the many matters I discussed with David Jaffe in the course of our explorations together of the concepts underlying his first focus project, Visualizing 19th Century New York, which opened in 2014. At a relatively early stage in the conceptual preparation of visualizing 19th century New York, David had a leave fellowship at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in North American History at Harvard. Each fellow has to present his or her work in progress at the Warren Center and History Department seminar. This is a notoriously fierce group. I've seen internationally distinguished historians reduced to blubbering wrecks by <laughs> tough questions from Harvard's ruthless faculty. Or at least I've seen them turn white as sheet. I was determined to be there when David presented his work as what I hoped might be a supporting presence with a sponge and towel, as it were. The room was packed. But David had received his PhD at Harvard as a student of Bernard Balin, and he knew the score. David presented his research questions and his slides of an array of pertinent material culture items with his initial arguments, some confidently, some tentatively. Some historians will be skeptical of the value of material culture to historical inquiry, no matter what a proponent may say, and there were plenty of skeptics in that room. But David made a brilliant case, clearly won over several doubters, and emerged with some excellent new suggestions from his interlocutors. Above all, he came away with a vindication of his approach and his agenda. I count it as a turning point in the development of his own confidence in pursuing the project with an exhibition and a digital publication as its outcome. Visualizing 19th century New York had been David's first foray into the investigative mode of the research exhibition, and in spite of the challenges, he really took to it. It was a triumph. He realized that this was a medium he could master, and this success prompted David to propose a second project on New York's Crystal Palace. Vital to David's method in pursuing his research agenda in both projects were two interlocking factors his championing of digital media as a vital constituent of the project in sometimes, to me at least, alarmingly innovative ways, and his championing of the capability of his students to produce first-rate work that could, that could become not ancillary, but part of the very substance of the project. This was no less true of New York Crystal Palace than of visualizing 19th century New York. He worked tirelessly with successive directors of the Digital Media Lab, uh, Kimon Karamidis and Jesse Mirandi, 
to produce digital components that embodies his students' work no less than his own. His was the dedication of a teacher confident in the abilities of his students no less than that of a research scholar. As we know, David tragically did not live to see the results of all his work on New York Crystal Palace. Everyone on the team from both the gallery and degree programs has striven to realize David's vision for the project. This is one vital example of how the inspirational work of one faculty member can bring together the two parts of Bard Graduate Center, the gallery on the one hand and degree programs and the research institute on the other in a single endeavor. This is part of David's legacy in this remarkable place that has a resonance far beyond its walls. Now, to pursue and discuss further the collaborative nature of New York Crystal Palace and David's leadership role in its realization, I'm going to be joined by four of the many participants who worked, whose work has made this project possible, and I'd like to invite them to come up to the table now, and then I will introduce each briefly. So leading the charge is Jesse Morandi, director of the Di Digital Media Lab at the far end. And beside him is Ana Estrades, who is a curatorial assistant in the gallery. And then beside her is uh, Caroline Hanna, associate curator and production curator for the project. And <coughs> nearest to me is Lara Schilling, who's manager of education and community outreach for the gallery. I should add that both Anna and Lara, who are graduated from Bard Graduate Center 2016 with their master's degrees and were students of David on this project. So I'm going to ask each of them in turn to make a brief statement about their individual roles in the project. And let's start at the far end with, with Jesse. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. It's really an uh, honor to be here and celebrating this uh, exhibition launch. It was a very trying at times and difficult process, and um, I really will reiterate Ivan's words that it really took a team, a community, and a family to realize this project. And I'm proud to have been a part of that, and I think the work stands on its own um, from the inception and David's ideas to the realization in the gallery. It's a really powerful statement of his uh, intellectual scholarship and his championing of student work and working with his fellow faculty and staff members to realize just an amazing project. So I just wanted to say that first. Um, so part of uh, working with David, he I will just say that he had a very ambitious digital plan and in fact starting from the groundwork he laid with the Visualizing 19th Century New York project, he actually was looking to ramp up the next level for the Crystal Palace and had um, a, I would say, there's four projects that are visible here, but a five-pronged digital uh, approach to what he wanted to integrate between the gallery and the digital elements that were going to be in the gallery, but that would also be the legacy of the exhibition following the closure of the gallery, uh, the actual exhibition. So at first, in our initial meetings, and it, it was, uh, he had proposed these different aspects, and, and I was thinking how this was a lot of work. This was going to be a, quite an incredible uh, lift. And then, so there was the one that is not shown up here is an audio tour, and I'll, I'll briefly describe these. but. I was suggesting, David, maybe we should cut back on the, maybe not do the audio tour, but he's like, the audio tour stays. It was like, the one thing he fought, so he was like, we are keeping the audio tour. And you could just get a sense of, like, his vision was set, and he was determined to realize that vision. So uh, I've carried that passion through with, like, I wanted to make sure that we honored that, because he fought so hard for it, and I was willing to fight for it him to get these projects realized. So there, the four parts are really, uh, we'll talk more about the exhibition, but the digital publication is the uh, kind of the uh, digital alternate to the text publications that we typically do for the exhibition uh, shows. 
so this embodies all of the students' work in the essays, and this is really a, one of the ways I think David Page tributes to the upcoming scholars in the field, because uh, aside from his introduction, this work is his students' work and featured um, quite nicely in a very beautiful publication. So you'll see all these in the gallery, and I hope you all get a chance to see these. But the publication has all of the essays as well as the objects. So this is, these were built in coordination, all, all the aspects I'll show you were built in coordination with CHIPS, who is a development company, and the great team we have here. So it starts in the focus group in many, many meetings, and we review David's plans and go back and forth with him, and then we start talking to developers and end up with these beautiful projects, which are, uh, as I said, a real collaborative effort between all aspects of our institution. You'll be able to see all these in the gallery, as I was saying. So this is just for instance, I know this is one of Ivan's favorite slides, the, <laughs> the destruction of the Crystal Palace here. Um, and all of the chats here and the, the tombstones were all written by the students as well, and their names are, are all visible throughout the project. I think that was one of the things that struck me is David had published and he had been in the field for a while and it was really his, his drive to make sure that the students would um, be, get the visibility in this project, although his, his, he's obviously uh, involved in all aspects of this. So um, let me just, this is hard, I'm going to have to crane my neck here to go. Um, the next part. So each of these tried to address an aspect of the New York Crystal Palace, which was otherwise difficult to convey through just the objects of the exhibition. So these were all additive. They were not meant to be uh, digital tricks to just put in the gallery to um, entertain the visitors, although I feel they are very entertaining. These digital humanities, I consider this a, a monumental digital humanities project, which asks engaging questions, creates uh, an engaging way to present that material and also asks the audience to participate and uh, be involved in that final creation. So this stroll through the Crystal Palace was a really a way to look inside the Crystal Palace, which is very difficult. There are only a few surviving photographs, which you can see uh, one of them in the exhibition. Uh, this uh, engraving is from 1854 from uh, Gleason's Pictorial allows you to look through and kind of scroll through the <coughs> exhibition and get a really detailed look at this amazing work, but also um, try to imagine what it was like to be in this space, surrounded by people in a, a, uh, a physical space that was just chocked full of uh, exhibitions, objects, and sculptures, and artworks. So this is this was just came out beautifully. I loved working on this. Um, and then the visitor's companion was looking at a way to, that we could ask, um, ask questions about what it was like outside the Crystal Palace, so contextualizing the exhibition in a more uh, interactive way. What else was going on? What, how did people get to the Crystal Palace? What did, they, what did they do other than the Crystal Palace? What was there to see? So. Um, I worked on this with uh, Anna. This was one of the parts of the project that was, I would say, the yeah. least developed. Um, when David w became ill, it, it was very difficult to, we wanted to honor him in every aspect. And while he was able to, we were trying to, you know, encourage him to participate. But at a certain point, with hav having to know we had to realize the project, um, and then when he passed, I would say Anna did an amazing job, and, and true to David's vision, I, the first thing I thought was to re-involve students back in making this project uh, become a reality, and so I invited Anna, I invited other students, my DML staff were instrumental in finding information, doing more research than had already been done to bring this to light, so this was really a, a, an amazing tribute also to David's vision. You can. Browse this more. I won't go into them too much, but each of these sections you can learn more. This was Niblo's 
uh, Saloon, which was another one of the first fine dining restaurants of the time. And you can kind of uh, go through this map and get a chance to look at some of the amazing things that were going on in New York City. So this one really was a, an attempt to root uh, root visitors to our exhibition in the historic context of the time. And then finally, if I can, it's going to be hard for me to see, was the audio tour. And this was, as I said, mm -hmm. David was championing this audio tour. So this was an amazing way to bring human life and voice and create, um, I encourage you all to go visit this when you're in the gallery. Um, there are bookmarks and there are instructions on how to do so, but if you visit nycp.audio, you can access this page. And throughout the exhibition, there are tour stops and you can listen to one of these three voices which will offer their unique perspectives on the exhibition. And so this was uh, really fun to produce and worked with uh, staff and students to record the voices. I myself played the part of Walt Whitman. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to sample just because this is really great. And if they, uh, So this is Aunt Kitty. This was from Peterson's Magazine, which was a, I guess, a manners. So it was a magazine. And this mm -hmm. was a fic serialized um, piece of fiction writing and when you read it you really hear this voice of this woman visiting from rural Pennsylvania and she's not a refined lady at all but she is reacting very honestly to the hubbub around her and yeah and so we tried to keep true to that voice that was on the paper so this but was these were all I should say that all these scripts were written by students all mm -hmm. the interactives were conceptualized by the students in their initial phase and really quite quite developed yeah so yeah the groundwork was laid it was a uh, it was very uh this was entertaining let me play you a clip from uh the machine gallery is that uh, I don't know. this was so these are all connected to objects in the exhibition space so. Did you ever see, see so, so many, many mechanical, mechanical contrivances in one place, place before? A body, a body hardly, hardly knows, knows where, where to begin. begin. I, I reckon it'd take all one's born, born days to see it all. I thought, I thought we, we might, might start, start by looking, looking at some of the newest inventions, inventions for the home. In, in the machine arcade. You must see this in the sewing machine. It is a true labor-saving device. Look how quickly and evenly it stitches. My, it's noisy and quick. I find it rather frightening. I wonder, I wonder what, what old John and Jones, the tailor down our way, way, would think of it. Anyhow, it's, it's a blessing to have the dumb iron thing doing, doing the work of a human creature. Just think, you could make all the latest fashions right in your own home. The thought of a dozen new dresses thrills me. Not me. I haven't needed a new dress in years. And hand stitching does the job perfectly well. With all the other work needing to be done, how do these women demonstrate here even find the time to learn how to use that word machine? The thought of it exhausts me. So that was one, one example. And uh, that was our Melissa Gerstein, who works in our public, um, public programming office, and Alyssa Velasquez, who is a student here, were the two voices for that. So I encourage you all to listen to the audio. Each one of them is very unique and gives a really uh, different perspective. The last one, besides Walt Whitman, is uh, a character, a, fic a fictional character by the name of Philip de Grasse, who is a African-American porter living in Seneca Village during the time of the exhibition. So it's a really unique kind of um, person who did not get to go inside the exhibition, but looks at it from an outsider's perspective. And David was always, pushing this, uh, looking through these different lenses as a way to understand this exhibit that wasn't always uh, a miraculous, shining, gleaming beacon of uh, hope and in industry. It was a very, it was very fraught in a very difficult time as much as there were innovations occurring. There was also uh, social issues which were, I think, are freshly looked at through this character's voice. So I encourage you all to look at it and all of these throughout the exhibition. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> that's, that's great. Great introduction.
So Anna, since you were so involved in the in in the digital elements, would you like to uh, start from start? the digital yeah. elements? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to this uh, talk. It's a pleasure for me to share. Uh, what I have contributed to this project because it has really been a full year for me uh, since I started as a student with Professor Jaffe in, in the spring of last year and now it's spring again and uh, I was at the opening last night dressed in period clothes with my cameo. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, the interactive actually is uh, a very good example of the student faculty and curatorial collaboration and uh, as Jesse already introduced, I had to um, come back <laughs> right, um, and work <laughs> further uh, in that interactive. When I was a student in the spring, um, we were four working in this student interactive. I see one of my colleagues here, Sheila. And, uh, Sheila. and back then we had to do the audio scripts we had to do the digital publications our own essays we had to do research it was a lot to take in so our exterior interactive had um we had a, a the flesh out the full idea and is what you see here is um uh, a newspaper from the time uh with three different city sections from uh, the building, the Crystal Palace that you see top, to the Latin Observatory and the neighborhood uh, around the Crystal Palace. And then attractions in the city and also how to get to the Crystal Palace. Um, so we did have these sections and each of, you, if each of us contributed to them, but uh, we couldn't dig that deep in them. So when I came in, I used that information and then I had to uh, kind of do further research with Jesse. And one of the, uh, one of, I would say, challenges of that in doing it later is, for example, we needed to find public domain images <laughs> because it was kind of late to get all these copyright images in for all the hotspots that, uh, for example, you have um, here. So many of these images come from the New York Public Library digital collections, and you can actually find through, do a uh, search through public domain, which it was very useful. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I have to add anything to that, to the exterior. Um, I think it's uh, great that we, from the beginning, we had the idea of the experience uh, in the Crystal Palace and so the exhibition when you go there is divided between the exterior and the interior and that's why we have the two digital components divided as such between uh, what you can do outside and <laughs> get into the Crystal Palace and the building and then going inside and seeing the displays. So very two very different experiences that we wanted equally balanced for, for the show um, in content. And um, I wanted to give an example as well of another ax aspect. Can I go back? Yeah, click on the visitors I companion, the white yeah. text at the top. I don't see the mouse though, that's right. There you go. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. I don't see very well. Yeah. Okay, these are the two objects. What are you looking for? Just going to oh, the, yeah, uh, the objects. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one aspect I wanted to talk about is that research and the digital publication with the essays, because um, that's where you can find more information that is not just in the labels in the gallery. And uh, Professor Jaffe was very uh, supportive of my research on the medals. Uh, both awards of the fair and the commemorative medals. Uh, I have an obsession for miniature and medals, cameos, coins, medals. So it was like a pleasure for me to uh, engage in that research. And I have to say that the project was divided in two semesters and I took part in the second semester. So for me, it was very important to um, use the awards uh, because there is this whole publication on the official words of juries and 
It has all the information you need about all the exhibitors, their addresses in New York uh, or elsewhere, <laughs> also for the foreign countries participating. And why they receive a medal if they got an award or an honor of mention. And many people got awards. <laughs> it's, um, the numbers are like something like, I have it in my essay, but um, um, you have like silver medals, that was the highest award, no gold medals, and the silver medals were given to about 100, 110 exhibitors. Then the uh, bronze medals were given to a oh, uh, thousand, over a thousand. Mm -hmm. And then you had honorable mention and it's several pages in this publication, so basically you have everybody mentioned in the publication. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we say a lot about uh, the Crystal Palace and how these wall spheres were really um, a platform for the exhibitors to uh, advertise their goods, to uh, you know promote what they were uh, making at the time. So I concentrated on two uh, manufacturers of glass and iron, uh, sorry, <laughs> and silver. Um, uh, or jewelry in general. So Tiffany and Co. and Glass, um, Brooklyn Glass Works, uh, because they epitomize the uh, Crystal Palace, the building, the uh, materials that I know we will hear more about from Amy Ogata. Um, so that is that, but actually, um, I have to say that Jaffe's contribution was opening my mind to. Yeah, it's very good, the medals, the awards, right? But uh, we have all these examples of um, iconography of the fair in commemorative medals and souvenirs and tokens with the advertising from uh, exhibitors like uh, Fiskivon Daguerreotype Gallery, which is um, a token we have in, in, in the case. Um, and so I explore all of those, and though they look very small in the in the case in the gallery, it was very uh, very fun, a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I I think <laughs> I don't want to go in on too much longer. I could talk about that <laughs> <medals. coughs> for the whole. <coughs> but yeah, I basically I think <laughs> what I wanted to <laughs> to um, conclude is that. Um, being part as a student and being part professionally in the gallery and seeing the project transform and come to fruition was uh, a pleasure and very special. And I wish David Jaffe was here with us, uh, but I know he will be really pleased with uh, the job we made collaboratively. Thank Good. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mara Schilling was uh, a classmate of Anna, uh, both graduating at the same time as I mentioned, uh, now uh, beginning professional career like Anna in the gallery uh, as the um, uh, manager of public outreach. I'm forgetting it exactly, but is that close? Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. So, Lara, will you tell us what you've what you've particularly gained from this whole experience? Yes, um, so as Anna um, and Jesse already iterated, um, David's vision has been so central to this project from the very beginning. Um, and I took part in his course uh, both semesters last year, so from fall 2015 to spring 2016. And then um, with all of the work on the digital essays um, that are in the publication, um, the edits went into fall. Um, Caroline was really wonderful about helping me with edits um, and working through that. And that was, um, I think as a student, you know, obviously we do a lot of writing here at Bard Graduate Center, lots of research papers, lots of presentations. Um, but the opportunity to really have somebody go through line by line and edit your work and make suggestions and for you to then have to go back and keep working with it and kind of banging your head against the wall a little bit is, um, it's a really, really amazing experience and I was so grateful to be able to do that. Um, that was kind of my first time having that sort of more professional experience writing and editing. Um, when we first started the course in fall 2015, David was sort of like, you know, 
there isn't much secondary literature on the Crystal Palace. Like, this is a fact that we're starting this course with. And so it was really about calling together um, a lot of materials from his visualizing 19th century um, New York exhibition, as well as the classes that went along with it. Um, and then completely encouraging all of us to embark on our own research um, and to pursue whatever our, you know, whatever direction that might be, that was acceptable and he wanted us to do it. And our final project for that fall semester was for each person to come up with a mini exhibition. Um, and all of the work on these, this component of the project happened on our wiki, which is, um, I think now we use WordPress, but previously um, all courses have wikis and usually professors use them to post the syllabi, um, you know, weekly assignments. Um, David is one of the professors at BGC who loves having his students really use it as a workspace and as a collaborative workspace um, where you can share resources, test out ideas, um, and that's exactly what we did. And that's, I think, all of our final projects, um, which were mini exhibitions about the Crystal Palace, live there. Um, my particular interest uh, in this project was in the exterior world of the palace. Um, in the, the catalog, you know, the formal catalog, um, official catalog of the New York Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations was the title. Um, published in 1853, right when the palace opened. Um, and the very first line, I think, of that publication is that the shape of the ground is unfavorable for architectural purposes. <laughs> and I thought, I remember reading this and thinking like, well then why would you put, you know, why would you put the palace there? And you know, David was, David made sure to, to tell us many, many times that you know, 42nd Street wasn't like 42nd Street today. There wasn't much there. The Croton Reservoir was right there, but people didn't really live up there. Union Square was kind of, you know, and up a little bit into the 20s, into Chelsea, it was kind of the furthest extent. Um, and the, the next sentence is, you know, aside from the facilities of access afforded by the avenue railways and numerous lines of stages, there's nothing to recommend this locality. <laughs> and so that's really, this was the seed of kind of everything that I ended up doing for the project. I ran with it and I said, okay, I'm going to look into public transportation in this period. Um, that's what I really want to do. You know, I mean, what's the difference between an, am an avenue railway and a line, and a stage line? You know, I had no vocabulary for this at the time. Um, and David was super encouraging. He loved the idea and he just let me completely run with it. Um, and I ended up consulting tons and tons of primary sources, primarily um, through digitized newspapers, um, which was kind of a new, um, that was a new avenue for me um, in, my, in my research work. <laughs> yeah, there's my digital essay. <laughs> yeah, Struggle for the Shady Side of the Omnibus, that's taken directly from a period newspaper. Um, and one of my interests was in, you know, what would it have been like to ride in one of these, <coughs> in one of these conveyances? You know, they were rattling over the cobblestones. Um, until the avenue railways were put in, starting around 1852, 1853, um, which were you know grooved metal rails along the roads so that the carriages could ride smoothly and more quickly. They were just running along the cobblestones and in the dirt, and it must have been so loud. And probably people had really bad backs. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <coughs> and uh, in addition to that, um, I also worked uh, very extensively on one of the audio tours. I worked on the Philip de Grasse audio tour um, about the African-American Carter living in Seneca Village, um, who he is based on historical sources, but he's a completely fictionalized personage. Um, we found accounts of you know, numerous African-American men living in New York at the time who were named Philip de Grasse, and we thought, okay, this is, you know, it's a plausible name. So um, we went with that, and um, this allowed us to tell a story um, about what was happening outside of the Crystal Palace, but that couldn't really be shown through exhibition objects. Um, it's unknown whether African Americans were allowed into the Crystal Palace. Um, there's some doubt that they were able to enter. Um, and my group really wanted to think about what it would have been like for an outsider um, to experience the palace. and. Um, Seneca Village at that time, which some of you might know, um, is one of the one of the first African American communities, free African American communities in New York, um, which is between 82nd and 85th Street, between 7th and 8th Avenues, in what is now Central Park. Um, and by 1852, 1853, um, there were a few hundred people living there. Um, and in 1853 around the time that the palace opened, the palace opened July 15th, 1853, the New York State Legislature um, decided to uh, 
allow a park to be built, allow Central Park to go through and be built um, using eminent domain, um, which meant that everybody <coughs> living in Central Park at that time, I think it was 1,500 people or something like that, including the Seneca Village residents, um, they all had to leave. Um, and so this audio tour of Philip de Grasse allowed us to talk about, you know, deliveries he made to the Crystal Palace and sort of seeing its construction, seeing all of the hubbub outside of it, and experiencing a little bit of hope about this kind of maybe the Crystal Palace's beacon of democracy, freedom. And then on the other hand, um, you know, he talks about the Fugitive Slave Act. He talks about the very real fears um, of people in his community. Um, and his last entry on the audio tour um, is uh, the day after the Crystal Palace burns um, on October 5th, 1858. And um, this is also uh, about two years after um, all the residents living in Seneca Village were forced to, to leave their homes. And so it's kind of, we, we very intentionally drew some parallels kind of about, you know, hopes invested in this great World's Fair um, and, you know, questioning how successful it really was um, and then using the burning a little bit to talk about, you know, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing of the Civil War, what was to come. You should hear it through the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> so in introducing Caroline Hanna, uh, who was the uh, who's associate curator in the gallery and the cu and the production curator for the for the whole uh, endeavor? Uh, I just want to mention that she recently received her PhD. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, in that sense, I kind of have both sides, both on staff and the curatorial spectrum perspective and a bit of the student perspective because I did work on one of the first student projects, Face Mania, which <laughs> dates me as many things do. But um, in any case, it was a real pleasure to come in and work on this project with David. I can't, it's probably good that I'm going last because I really came in in the later stages. I wasn't on staff during the courses. Um, but I came, when I came in, I was handed the checklist, which students developed. Students were really integral to all, uh, all stages of this project. And, and I think that's really an interesting, and it's very much the choice of the faculty curator to the degree of their involvement. Um, but I, I got to have you know, some fun with it. Um, you know, as with you know, any kind of exhibition that you're putting together, something you ask for things, some things co you, know, you get, some things you don't. Then you realize, okay, what have we got? Um, few holes to fill, what do we do? Um, and so we, you know, I had the task, you know, we kind of went back and forth, well, if we don't have, you know, some of the key objects that David wanted in technology, for example, a daguerreotype camera, um, the hollow back violin that was um, invented by William Sidney Mount, we have the patent for it, um, we didn't get that from the Smithsonian. They have it on view, um, understandably. But, you know, I, I was tasked with, well, do, are there others? There must be. And, um, you know, and finding some of these objects to fill these holes. So that was, that's a bit of the fun that curators have in going and doing research. Mm -hmm. I found out, yes, there are more cradles of harmony out there by reading the liner notes of, of Mount's <laughs> fiddle music because he was a composer, too, and he... He created a number of little <coughs> dance tunes, which he also performed in the Crystal Palace. And the whole idea with the hollow back is that it made it louder for, for country dances. So I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. And that was an object that um, David was particularly keen on having, so he was really pleased that we were able to, to locate one. Um, being an objects person, it's very important for me as part of my practice to see objects and to understand them and to understand, you know, all the various stories. Um, and you do have to restrain yourself because, of course, you're trying to hew to a particular narrative or set of narratives within within an exhibition. And, and that's always, you know, it's a little hard. I, you know, I have, you know, I kind of span a l large part of the history of the um, Bard Graduate Center in that I also did my master's degree before coming back to do my PhD. So I have that. In fact, I did my first internship with Kevin Staten at the 
at the um, at the Brooklyn Museum. So I was, you know, in the in storage, looking at all kinds of objects, trying, you know, ceramics and things, trying to sort them out. And I w was able to do a bit of that with this too, because we realized, you know, um, one of the, you know, developing the any focus project, we're very much a team <coughs> that's um, <coughs> different, I think, than our main galleries. In some respects, we have, you know, a team from academic, the academic side and the gallery side working together to kind of realize these things with the curator. Um, and one of the comments that came up in an early presentation of the exhibition design was, you know, this was so much about Victorian density. Are we conveying that? And, you know, at one point we were looking at, you know, when our checklist was coming together and we had a few turndowns and we had one very small press glass goblet one very large chair and not much in between <laughs> a little a little peri and statue of a very nice uh, nice nice um, lady but that's that's what we what we had so you know then I was like well we could fill this up and I had to you know restrain myself to thunder but we did bring in some, you know very nice tabletop because this was so much a moment for New York for um, East Coast manufacturers it's you know in my one of my areas of research is in the American ceramics industry which I was able to go to a private lender to fill that gap and it's you know it's so much tied to the technology of the day to the um, economy you know the way he described it to me this is a high point between two low points because while those manufacturers were able to produce Parian were able to produce porcelain at that moment they all closed within three years so it's it's really hard to keep the capital up so even though that's a you know a very pretty arrangement in the middle it also tells a story about um, business and industry and entrepreneurship and also you know a subtext that came up is is immigrant artisan skills because <laughs> all of these various industries the wood carving the um, ceramics manufacturing the glass cutting which you know being able to develop you know those immigrants were from Baccarat I mean we can see why they could make you know these beautiful deep cuts they were bringing their technology and applying it to conditions here in this country so that was a big part of my role fleshing out the checklist and then also working with all everyone on the various components particularly in the text of course because we're very much you know, we, we believe in research and we believe in putting that out, you know, the words out there. So there's a lot of, a lot of components to that. Thanks so much, Caroline. <laughs> so in the, in the short time left to us, I, I just want to pose at least one question to all of you, for any of you or all of you, uh, but not speaking all at once, mm -hmm. to pick up. Uh, and the question I'd like to ask you in particular is, does this project differ from exhibitions in other institutions, in your estimation? And if so, how does it differ? How, do these, how does this project and the focus projects as a, as a, as a genre uh, differ from what happens elsewhere? Any thoughts? I know that working in the digital, that the because we're so focused on study of material culture and object studies that um, this was really a unique uh, experience, I think, uh, bringing together this full community. I think that defines the Bard Graduate Center in many ways, is that, you know, from getting the, uh, somebody from public programming to come and record a voice, uh, voice tour, from working with Caroline, and, and Marianne in the gallery, to working for me with my DML staff of students and with students from David's class and all those aspects coming together. I think as a research institution, bringing together the working knowledge and the research that went into David's class and then further after that, combined with the like first rate gallery staff to realize this project, I think I, I would say that that for me would separate this project from other institutions in that there's just a full-on collaborative partnership between all aspects of our institution and it, I think it's a real tribute to this to this place 
Great. Thanks, yeah. Jesse. I will also add briefly that um, there is a lot in-house, not just the digital media department. There is an in-house designer for the gallery, and a lot is is done in-house from label printing and the co quotations that you see on the walls. All that has been the reproductions has been done in-house, and that I think is very unique because allows <coughs> us to be creative and mm -hmm. keep it. Mm, as we want, want it to look like. Control, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Any thoughts? I just think it is very much about the process. And I mean, I would kind of revert that question back to the audience. Is that repro process reflected in the product, in the gallery, and in the digital elements, the publication? Because, you know, from my standpoint, you know, just having, you know, this many people involved at different points and at different levels is a very interesting and a very um, energizing way to work. I really, I do really like that, that, that collaborative aspect. But does it show? I, we have a lot of text <laughs> in the gallery, and I think that's one, one, uh, that's one result, but maybe well. others. Yeah, I think I would say that... Um, as I've been kind of walking through the exhibition yesterday evening and also earlier today um, and thinking about, you know, my experiences working with David um, and what excited me about his particular perspective and his work um, was his talent for really bringing together material culture with, like, very strong attention to social history and thinking about, like, how people lived and trying to get us students and I think also to get exhibition visitors to really feel that like from the almost the first session when we met last fall um, or fall 2015 for the class we read about um, the dome of the Crystal Palace which was like a hundred feet in diameter and colored glass patterned and so many people in the period commented on, on how brilliant it was and we sat there in the class and we talked for 20 or 30 minutes about all the different ways that we could recreate this feeling of the dome. And, you know, that was, David gave time and attention to that. Like, that was important to him, that we work through those ideas. And it was about the experience. It was, you know, trying to feel what 19th century people might have felt. And that's something that I've, like, really taken away and think about a lot in my own research now. So it seems to me from what you're saying that what is really particular about how David went about this project and how other members of the faculty who have done and are doing focus projects go about their, uh, their work is uh, that this is about process as much as about product. And I think that's something that's vitally important and, uh, and distinguishes Bard Graduate Center's approach uh, from other institutions. It's about how you get to where you get to in the end, rather than just getting there. And I think that's something that David uh, exemplified in a remarkable way. So I'd like to thank our four panelists for sharing their experiences on this wonderful project with us. So thanks so much. <laughs>
and we miss her. She's the author of Designing the Creative Child, Playthings and Places in Mid-Century America, which was published in 2013, and which won last year the Alice David Hitchcock Prize from the Society of Architectural Historians. She's the author of uh, a number of other works, including uh, Fredon Chapur, Playing with Design in 2013, and A Nouveau and the Social Vision of Modern Living. Uh, a few years earlier, in 2001. Many of you will remember the wonderful exhibition, which when I first saw the title made me think, what, the, what on earth is going on here? Uh, <laughs> Swedish Wooden Toys, which was terrific. Uh, that was in 2014, here in the gallery. And she co-curated that with our founding director, Susan Weber, and co-edited the, uh, the publication. And her current research is on French Second Empire and the materiality of metal. So it's only appropriate that she should be addressing us this afternoon on iron architecture and mid-century crystal palaces. Please welcome Amy Ogata. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. As I'm sure my colleagues will agree, David Jaffe was a mensch. His presence on the faculty of the Bard Graduate Center made us stronger as a unit and catalyzed the institution's many priorities. After he was hired in 2007, we focused our attention on digital projects, affirmed a commitment to pedagogy, and to the care and well-being of our students, which was always his chief concern. David's scholarship on the 19th century attests to his devotion to the wide world of things, including things that were critically significant but had not garnered much attention, objects such as globes, and events such as the 1853 Crystal Palace exhibition in New York City. When he invited me to speak here today, I was quick to accept, assuming naively, that he'd be here. Uh, I'm grateful to him for not only this opportunity to return to the BGC, but for his exceptional kindness and collegiality. Indeed, it's an honor to participate in his last scholarly project. I miss him, as I'm sure we all do, very acutely. America's First World's Fair, the exhibition of industry of all nations, which opened in New York on Reservoir Square in July 1853, was closely styled on the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations held in Hyde Park in central London in 1851. We have New York on top and London on the bottom. In addition to mounting a grandiose show of goods and machines, uh, the exhibition adhered to the economic logic of welcoming the world on the premise of peace and free trade and showcasing one's own domestic products as well. Many of these were reproduced in Benjamin Silliman's illustrated catalog on your right, which was modeled on the art journal illustrations on your left, which detailed in wood engravings the objects on view. Although the London exhibit had a royal and parliamentary patronage, and the New York version was entirely run by private enterprise, much of what the New York Fair aimed to achieve was modeled directly on London. Yet it was the construction of a new building to house the temporary exhibition that most clearly signaled the emulation of the British Fair. The memorable shorthand name, Crystal Palace, a name first bestowed by a writer for the satirical magazine Punch, definitively marked the two exhibitions. Aside from the New York Crystal Palace of 1853, there was a succession of similar structures, all used for temporary exhibitions, which all followed on the London model. Dublin held an international exposition the same year, in 1853, constructing a temporary iron and glass palace with a grand barrel vault. Officials in Munich also attempted to emulate the astonishing success of the London show with their 1854 Glass Palace exhibition, which included a building erected in six months from iron and glass. In 1855, the French Emperor Napoleon III opened his newly constructed Palace of Industry on the Champs-Élysées, which had a masonry exterior and a vaulted interior space with an unprecedented span of 48 meters. 
1851 Crystal Palace, having been disassembled and moved from Hyde Park to Sydenham, meant that officials planning the 1862 exhibit in London had to build another new structure. This one meant for reuse. Finally, the 1867 building of the Paris Exposition Universelle, which, had, which was erected on the Champs, Champs de Mars, embraced the metallic structure anew, creating an oval form entirely of iron and glass. This series of buildings, crystal palaces, all of them, provide a means of exploring the ways that the materiality of iron and its glass complement was understood as a motif of this historical mid-century moment. So this afternoon, I want to trace how the notion of a crystal palace identified a new type of structure, the exhibition building, and its association with the mid-century materials of iron and glass in New York, London, and Paris. Beyond the similarity of names, materials, and uses, however, I argue that the ferrovitreous building, which was so beloved of the first historians of modern architecture who looked to exhibition building as a microcosm of the emergence of a tectonic modernism, was also bound to a discourse of immateriality. The design of the New York Crystal Palace kept the London example in full view. The debt to the London Crystal Palace, oops, here's the photograph of the New York version, the debt to the London Crystal Palace was clear in both intent and design. The architects of the New York structure were a Dane, George Karstensen, and a German, Charles Gildemeister, who were working with the brief to emulate the English fair and particularly its structure. Their design was chosen over a more muscular scheme by the American architect James Bogardus, who had proposed a Roman Colosseum in iron. The system of iron, columns, and girders owed directly to the Fox and Henderson engineering firm that had created the Crystal Palace in London. Yet in spite of this, the architects insisted upon the Americanness of the New York Crystal Palace. The site uh, of the Croton Reservoir at 6th Avenue and 42nd Street was har hardly resembled the picturesque placement of the London show in Hyde Park. And the architects of the New York building aimed to minimize the unfortunate comparison. As the original commission stated, quote, the fewer points of similarity there are between the two structures, the more favorable will be the impression of the New York Exhibition Building, since it will be endowed with the charms of novelty and originality, and thus escape the stigmatizing ridicule of being a miniature imitation of something much superior." Unquote. The design of the building banked up against the reservoir was therefore strategic. The architects adopted a similar scheme of nave and transept, but they gave it a Greek cross plan and added a dome to rise up against the fortress-like walls. Moreover, they added glass walls to the cruciform plan to form an octagonal structure, which afforded them more space. The building's girders were anchored to the octagonal towers that were eventually adorned, as you see here, with flags. Unlike the long nave and facade of the London building then, the New York Crystal Palace possessed a crystalline footprint. And instead of glass roofing, as in the British example, the American version had sheet uh, lead and zinc roofs to combat the harsh glare and snow of New York City. Karstensen and Gild Gildemeister argued that the design of the building was Venetian, a style, quote, most favorable for lightness and elegance combined with strength. This combination, lightness, and strength was precisely the charge of exhibition buildings that were intended to be easy to erect, to allow for daylight use, and exemplify serial production. The scheme, eventually chosen for the London structure, which you see here, by the horticulturist uh, Joseph Paxton was noted for its economy. Rejecting the hulking uh, brick structure proposed by the French architect Hector Oro, which actually won the competition for the 1851 fair, uh, in the end, the committee favored lightness and flexibility for the project. Paxton, as is often noted, was not an architect per se, but had been building greenhouse structures on some of the grandest estates in Britain, combining wooden forms with extensive use of glazing, as in the great stove on the estate of the Duke of Devonshire. He had also devised machines for moving mature trees, and he had engineered complex systems for waterworks. His design was also informed by a biological example close at hand. 
Paxton had been nourishing a specimen of the Victoria Regia, a giant tray-shaped water lily native to the shallow waters of the Amazon River, which was so large and structurally robust that it could hold the weight of his daughter, Annie, which you see over here on the right. The structural integrity of the lily's stem and ribs was likened, in Paxton's own words, to what iron could also perform. With the successful completion of the London Crystal Palace, the demands of strength and lightness embodied in the materials of iron and glass became hallmarks of all of the succeeding Crystal Palaces. The shocking openness of the 1851 London Crystal Palace was widely remarked in Britain and in Europe. Even before the Great Exhibition, 19th century critics admired iron for its flexibility and strength and its ability to create wider spans than was possible with masonry construction. The American critic, Horace Greeley, in a long essay on the London Exhibition, called the Crystal Palace, quote, the most capacious, convenient, economical, healthful, and admirable structure ever devised for any kindred purpose. Earth was ransacked for alluring marvels. Science racked its brains for brilliant combinations. Art exhausted its subtle alchemy in quest of dazzling effects. <laughs> Labor poured out its sweat like rain to fill the grand receptacle <laughs> with whatever is beautiful and winning. Yet the Crystal Palace remained to the end the crowning triumph of all. Unquote. In architectural history, iron buildings and exhibition buildings in particular have been viewed as a primal site of modernist experimentation. The first historians of modern architecture writing in the 1920s and 30s created a genealogy that privileged 19th century iron. In 1928, Siegfried Gideon claimed, quote, the history of exhibitions becomes the history of iron construction, unquote. Linking together the full material of iron, the exhibition building type, and the modern spirit of rational construction, Gideon argued, quote, in the history of exhibitions, one can trace directly the transformation of the old static feeling of load and support into a new system of suspended e equal equilibrium." Unquote. On this page of Bauern in Frankreich, he calls the iron buildings, and you can see it's down here on the last paragraph, maybe a little hard to read, um, both the muscular tissue and skeleton, and he likens glass to its skin. Um, it would be a mistake, though, to recapitulate the heroic story that Gideon tells, and that is not at all my aim. But the importance of iron for the middle of the 19th century should not be discounted, and indeed it offers an opportunity to consider how the medium itself, raw ores, mined, melted, and transformed into <coughs> cast and wrought forms, participated and enabled some of the grandest cultural statements of the age. These materials of iron and glass were favored for their lightness and strength and their ability to create open spaces and their ease of manufacture off-site and assembly on-site with a set of cast component parts that fitted together like, as one commenter noted, a toy. The mythic story of the congruence of modern architectural materials, the new age of free trade, and the explosion of machine manufactured goods embodied in the Great Exhibition of 1851, and to a different extent in New York in 1853, has fueled a modernist myth of a rupture. The New York example, which you see here under construction and as individual parts, uh, the different parts that would be constructed and create this larger whole, offers a useful check against these assumptions. Unlike the building in London, whose construction was a site of wonder and ceaseless progress, tickets were sold daily to view the construction, work on the New York building was beset with delays and acrimony. <laughs> the board of directors charged that the delay was the fault of the slowness in producing the architect's drawings. Uh, but in 1854, the building's architects, Karstensen and Gildemeister, defensively claimed that the problems lay in standardization, the demands of casting the cast iron which was produced in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. In all, there were 28 different firms producing metal for this New York fair. Amid the delays in procuring sufficient materials, it was suggested that in order to complete the dome, it be sent to Britain. According to Carstensen, quote, this is, uh, we could not for a moment think of permitting it to be said that in order to construct an American crystal palace, we were obliged to rely on English workmanship for the most important part of the structure. Unquote. 
the skeletal possibilities of iron impressed some, then others argued that iron was insufficiently solid and inappropriate material for monumental construction. The German architect Gottfried Zemper, who closely watched the construction of the 1851 building while in exile in Britain, claimed, there can be no question of a monumental style with cast iron rods. Its very ideal is invisible architecture. Zepper, of course, argued for the transmission of style through many different media, and for him, gusseisen, or cast iron, was like rubber, too readily accepting of the imprint, too easily manipulated to take on the look, if not the qualities, of another material. His claim that iron produced invisible architecture was in keeping with others who also voiced a critique that iron structures were too open and destroyed mass. If architects were critical, or excuse me, skeptical about the application of iron for monumental buildings, then they favored it for utilitarian structures, such as market halls and railway sheds. Paxton's Crystal Palace and those that followed were all in this category of buildings with a greater pragmatic rather than aesthetic demands. Yet the very qualities that disqualified iron and glass structures from the notion of architecture with a capital A gave it an allure of transparency that generated a number of appealing metaphors. Foremost is the concept of crystal, a material that has long <coughs> had mystical associations and is tied to natural wonder and sumptuous material value. Douglas Jarrell, the punch critic, whose description of the building then under construction in Hyde Park as, quote, a palace of very crystal, created an indelible association between the structure and worldly, otherworldly enchantment. V Queen Victoria, upon visiting the building herself, described the visual effect as a fairyland. Similar to the comparisons made with Paxton's earlier greenhouses, the experience of the 1851 Crystal Palace was likened to a brilliant and intoxicating Garden of Eden or a Midsummer's Night's Dream. These ethereal metaphorical images were only heightened by the structure's inclusion under glass of large existing trees on the site, exotic palms, and the placement of a crystal, oops, not advancing. It's not advancing, okay. Technical help. <laughs> I can't actually see it. Where's next? Oh, there it is. OK, it's back. Thank you. <laughs> Magic. Um, uh, OK, um, these ethereal Im metaphorical images were only heightened by the structure's inclusion under glass of large trees existing on the site, exotic palms, and the placement of a crystal fountain in the vaulted space on axis with the central portal. The fragility and clarity of the Crystal Palace marked it as a structure that enabled and even welcomed uh, fanciful idealization. The New York Fair was smaller, less than one-fifth the size of the London Crystal Palace, but it too embodied grand abstract ideals. It was, according to one visitor, quote, a pure and chaste vision of almost unearthly beauty. And when Walt Whitman penned his song of the exposition in 1871, he conjured up an after image of the New York Fair. Around a palace, loftier, fairer, ampler than any yet, Earth's modern wonder, history seven, outstripping, high rising tier on tier with glass and iron facades, gladdening the sun and sky, in hued, in cheerfulest hues, bronze, lilac, robin's egg, marine and crimson, over whose golden roof shall flaunt Beneath thy banner, freedom, the banners of the states, the flags of every land, a brood of lofty, fair, but lesser palaces shall cluster. The pictures of the building disseminated in photography and lithography show a structure that commands its site. The representation of the building in white paralleled the images of the 1851 Crystal Palace, suggesting the brilliant surface reflections of the glass panels that set it apart from the everyday ochre-colored city beyond it. At once opaque and transparent, the structure was designed to serve its purpose by training the gaze both at and into the exhibition. 
paper peep show views uh, of the London building, which proliferated at this time, suggest how one could both look at and into a building to survey the goods on display. But the whiteness of the New York structure is curious, since we know that many of its panels were enameled and opaque in order to cut down on glare and heat. And likewise, the dome was sheathed in lead panels. The building and the building was painted a bronze color with gilded highlights. In images of the interior of the New York Crystal Palace, the bronze equestrian statue of George Washington, which occupied the central space under the dome, was a favorite point of view. This prospect offered down the aisles the repeated pattern of cast iron columns and wrought iron girders, enhancing the effect of spatial recession. The proliferation of flat shapes of X's and circles and quatrefoils were picked out against the lacy web of the fan lights. The American painter, Henry Greeno, the brother of the sculptor Horatio, was hired to, deck, to design the interior of the New York Crystal Palace, which was largely painted an off-white color with red, yellow, and blue. Greeno, working with uh, uh, Angelo Monte Lila, devised a blue and gold scheme for the interior of the dome to set off its light-colored arabesques and stained glass windows. The contracting of an artist to design the interior angered the architects, Karstensen and Gildemeister, who stated, quote, the architect should always be a decorative artist. His task is but half completed when the structure is erected. From him and him alone should <laughs> emanate the rich masses of color, positive or low-toned, strengthening this, subduing that, leading the eye to certain points, giving solidity to others. Karstensen and Gildemeister advocated for a scheme used in London by Owen Jones, which you see over on your right, who employed red, yellow, and blue separated by white to the ribs of the nave to give chromatic harmony and to define the structure. And they charged that the dome in the hands of these painters, quote, lost a third of its apparent size by this distribution of colors. The vaults, which should have looked light, aerial, and expansive, has now been flattened down. Although the model of the Crystal Palace was architecturally daring and its visual effects were mostly enhanced by chromatic theory and could render it magical, it was insufficiently monumental for some contexts. Just two years after the New York Crystal Palace in 1855, the French emperor opened up his grand permanent exhibition building constructed on the Champs-Élysées on the right bank of the Seine. The Palais de l'Industrie kept the regal associations of palace, but put emphasis on the idea of industrial exhibitions, which had been held in France since the 1790s. If industrial mass production was only nascent in France in the 1850s, then the country could lean on a much longer legacy of showcasing products. The building's masonry facade afforded a grand triumphal arch with the allegorical figure of France, uh, distributing loyal laurels. You can see this is this kind of triumphal arch, and you see it over here on this commemorative fan as well. And the pictures of France are over on this side. Kind of split it up. Um, welcoming a uh, uh, featured allegory of France, welcoming um, the various states of manufactured goods. The designers of the Palais de l'Industrie were an engineer, Alexander Barreau, and an architect, Jean-Marie Vielle. In their three crystalline barrel vaults of iron and glass, which opened an in unprecedented span, were still present inside, but in order to fit into the city as a permanent fixture, they were subservient to traditional construction. Now for Gideon, this was, quote, a dangerous retrogression from the Crystal Palace model. Uh, similarly, the 1862 London International Exhibition was held in a new structure on the Cromwell Road, purpose-built for exhibitions and meant to last. It, too, had a masonry arcade with the 1851 Crystal Palace idea, again, embedded within in a vast vaulted space with not one but two glass domes. And while it was larger, the magic of iron and glass paled when compared with the brick facade. The 1862 building met with scathing reception. Critics called it a wretched shed, an architectural fungus, and the dome's colossal, colossal dish covers. <laughs> the supposedly permanent exhibition building proved unsuited to its use and was torn down after the end of the fair. The 1855 uh, Palace of Industry also proved unsuitable for later fairs, even one held only 11 years later. 
And when it was torn down, it was replaced, this is in the 1890s, with a new set of exhibition structures, the Grand and Petit Palais, erected for the Exposition Universelle of 1900. You might think of all of these crystal iron, iron palaces as an architecture of carbon. Energy was required to fuel the transportation of mined ores, which, smelted, which were smelted by coke or, and cast and wrought with additional fire. Glass, too, required high heat to take the paneled forms that were placed in the wooden sashes. As Jürgen Osterhammel has observed, energy was a leitmotif of the whole century, and metallurgy was one of the most significant industries of the age. Metallurgical activity underwrote the development of the railways, the expansion of steamships, and the building of exhibitions, not to mention the production of goods. French Emperor Napoleon III's enthusiasm for iron is well known, but perhaps the grandest statement of confidence in the age of iron and the proliferation of the metallic was the 1867 exposition, where ores, iron, and new processes for making steel thematized the French state itself. Like the exhibition of 1855, this fair was an invitation to view technical and artistic wealth. The conceit of the globe, encased in an ellipse-shaped iron building erected on the Champ de Mars, directed attention to the relationship between metal and prestige. The building was made largely of iron cast elsewhere and assembled on site. From the railroad to the exhibition's ellipse-shaped iron structure, the pavilions that dotted the surrounding park, which were also of iron, uh, made this metal uh, ubiquitous in 1867. The main entryway, uh, the Porte d'Honneur, facing the Pont d'Iena, was marked with a new cast iron fountain made by the Duren firm and a small steel bridge, the first one erected with Bessemer steel, which was made from newly mined Algerian ores, which were also on display in the Algerian section. A reviewer called these huge glistening nuggets uh, from these mines as the eighth wonder of the world. Inside the exhibition building, the prominent entry to the French section was a metallic trophy created from rods and tubes framing the central staircase to the upper level viewing platform. As I've tried to suggest, 19th century architects and theorists were not sure iron and architecture were words one could use together. But later write, writers like Gideon, who was looking backwards to understand his own age, understood iron as an agent in the construction of modernity. This page from his 1928 book, uh, Bauen und Frankreich, includes the image of a broken steel rod uh, under the heading of iron. Walter Benjamin, who was an enthusiastic reader of Gideon's book while preparing his arcades project, observed that iron construction was the technological signature of the 19th century. But if we put these aside, even in 1867, the engineer, economist, and Second Empire statesman Michel Chevalier proposed that the disappearance of gold might not trouble civilization, but the abduction of iron would cause an indescribable calamity. Quote, everything would slip backwards, civilization itself would be struck with impotence. Unquote. <coughs> If crystal, a material that's aqueous, shining, and radiant, seems to have the upper hand on iron in these crystal palaces, and iron, of course, the most common element of the Earth's crust, it's only when strengthened by carbon that it can be hard enough to work or to cast. Uh, and, even as, uh, and even as a structural form, it was often deemed invisible. Yet, as Chevalier suggests, iron was fundamental to the 19th century and to its very notion of civilization. To return to the New York Crystal Palace, it bears repeating that the building erected adjacent to the Croton Reservoir and the exhibition were of a piece. We cannot think of one without the other. The notion of putting on an industrial <laughs> exhibition and housing it in a crystalline structure was directly modeled on 1851, even if many aspects of the New York exhibition from the organization and the sponsorship to the size and scope of the exhibit were completely different. One more thing unites these crystal palaces, <laughs> their vulnerability to fire. On October 5th of 1858, a fire that began in an adjacent area spread to the exhibition building and quickly burned through the structure, leaving it a heap of twisted metal and ash. 
The London Crystal Palace, which had been moved to a hill in Sydenham, also burned to the ground in 1936, only five years after the Munich Glaspalast mm -hmm. had been set aflame and destroyed. These three, which managed to live on well after the exhibitions for which they were built had ended, all stood <coughs> as reminders of the resilience of iron building and ultimately also its fragility. If these iron and glass crystal palaces, diaphanous envelopes on iron skeletons, constructed in the 1850s were all doomed, then they continue to live on as sites of memory and as monuments to an ambitious industrial culture. Thank you. Okay. There's time for just a, for, a, for a few questions, although we will have a discussion at the end. But I know that a talk as rich as this prompts questions immediately in, the, or in members of the audience that they don't want to let go. So, yes. Uh, the uh, observation tower, you didn't mention that. Was yeah. That? It's, uh, well, the observation tower, um, there are other people here who know more about that observation tower than me. Yeah. I think it was built out of wood, in fact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it was uh, separate from the Crystal Palace. Yeah, it was it separate. Was a, it was like it was a. It was part of a kind of a honky tonk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> midway stuff yeah. that that just sprang up as a result of right. building the area. But there, there is something really interesting. I think as a theme in all of these world's fairs is the idea of looking, of observing, and having a tower in which to take in the prospect uh, is something that is you know, a theme through all of these things. This is one of the the reasons the Eiffel Tower is built in 1889. Yes. Uh, just quickly, you said in the New York uh, City Crystal Palace, the glass was opaque in many places. Could you <laughs> just elaborate on that? Um, well, uh, some of the panels, I'm not sure exactly which ones, but I think many of them were opaque. Um, they, they had uh, as a kind of frosting. They, they say enameled. Um, I'm not sure what that actually means technically, but um, the idea was to cut down on the glare. In London, they had found, even in a, an atmosphere as cloudy as that, that it was too harsh, and they had to put up these canvas um, kind of awnings inside uh, to cover it because uh, it was too hot and it was too bright. Yes, um, a New Jersey company did enamel every piece of the glass that was put on the, uh, uh, on the New York Crystal Palace. The company was in uh, Compton, New Jersey, that did that. Um, and when the governor did his uh, annual address, he mentioned this in 1853 for notoriety for New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, New Jersey. okay. Yeah. There's also a clear story level of windows, which are not frosted, though, uh, but they are, you can definitely see them still. Yeah. Yes. Did critics and others remark on especially the New York Crystal Palace resembling a cathedral. I mean, there's a rose window, there's, there's aspects of it, and the enameled glass and things like that that would give you a modern cathedral. Uh, not in what I've read, but I would defer to the students who've done all of the significant research on this. Uh, Fairyland, Fairy Palace, I mean, there's a quote right, from Samuel Clemens over in the gallery as well. This idea of an enchanted space rather than a kind of devotional space seems to be the kind of tenor, um, rather than, you know, something serious. Um, but I, you know, I, this is, I, there are people who, who would... I have seen it referred to as a temple. Yeah. Or generic, yeah. but, right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned the heat, which I would think would be in, impossible inside those, that building, but also the artwork and the art objects, wouldn't they have been, and even fabrics and other things that were being displayed there? Wouldn't it be Vulnerable? a detriment? <laughs> I assume yes. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I. Um, I. Yeah. I think the idea. You know, it's a statement uh, of of uh, a will to form this thing. You know, this this wanting to be able to create a crystal palace. No, in New I York. understand, but there was no talk about conservation. Of no. The no. 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 I think one last question from Fred. Yeah, I'll try to. Yeah, um, I'm really, of course, taken with this idea about. Um, invisible architecture and that it's an epithet in you know mid mid 19th century whereas you know those of us who are interested in things that happened in the early 20th century that's the whole point that's the whole point yeah. architecture dissolves um, but I think it's really fascinating that that also comes in conjunction with things like it being magical or like a fairyland and and there's the, there's this kind of 
um, shifting between you know the need for this kind of monumental, massive, literally massive architecture and the sense of the, f the magical or the fairy, which implies a kind of yeah. coming in and out of focus almost, right, or mm -hmm. a kind of presence and absence mm -hmm. and um, dreamlike yeah. states. And I'm wondering if, you know, I know you've done lots of work on other things related. Is that something that, um, you, know, you said other people in Zampa are talking about invisible architecture or something that means there's something lacking? Well, it's, if it's for monumentality. Yeah. It lacks for monumentality. Yeah. It's a fine for railway sheds and market halls, mm -hmm. um, which are utilitarian, and mm -hmm. as is this. And non magical. Right. I mean, that's and easy too, not, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, they're, you know, they're spectacular. Right. Um, and in terms of, you know, what you can actually do, create wider spans, mm -hmm. all that. But in terms of a kind of, you know, cultural statement that's going to be lasting, they, at the time, were suspicious of this, fascinated with what, it could, what, what could be done and the materials but not qu quite convinced. Um, and part of it, again, is this ease with which this material takes on many forms. Um, so th there is a kind of, yeah, a, a sense of, a, a lack of, of certainty about it uh, as any kind of authentically architectural statement, cultural statement. I'd love to be able to take more questions, but I think we should take a break. But before, before um, we leave uh, and before we come back, uh, at exactly half past uh, in 21 minutes time. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to thank Amy O'Gata for <laughs>
Thank you. I know that coffee and tea can act as necessary stimulant, and uh, and it's also wonderful that you have so much. There's so much to discuss um, in in the at the during the break. There'll be plenty of time for chance for discussion again later. But now we move on to our second lecturer, who's Stephen Lubar. And it's a wonderful privilege to be able to introduce Steve here this afternoon. Stephen Lubar is professor of, um, of so many things. I'm going to read the many things. American studies, history, history of art and architecture uh, at Brown University, where he's been since 2004. And he's also had uh, additional responsibilities, which I'm sure he's grateful to have relinquished now, but uh, he has also been director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage, a post he held for 10 years between 2004 and 2014, and director of the Hafenreffer Museum of Anthropology between 2010 and 2012. And that might sound like a short tenure, but it was absolutely vital because Steve brought the Hafenreffer Museum out from the cold in Bristol, Rhode Island, right into the center of, the, of uh, Brown University in Providence, uh, having a physical presence which was literally unavoidable uh, in, in the university. A tremendous achievement. I don't know how you manage that politically. <laughs> now, before moving to Brown in 2004, uh, Steve was chair of the Division of the History of Technology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Art. So he's one of the fairly small group of people who really has spanned the museum and academic areas of scholarship. Um, so I feel a certain affinity with him from that, from that point of view. Last year, he was a Guggenheim Fellow. He's also a pr prolific author, and I will just mention a number of his, his books, uh, of which he was author or co-author, Legacies, Collecting America's History at the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian Book of Information Age Inventions, History from Things, and Engines of Change, the American Industrial Revolution. Uh, he's also, of course, as a, 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 a long-term experienced museum curator, he has organized a number of important exhibitions, America on the Move, Smithsonian's America, and Engines of Change. And he's also uh, organized a number of exhibitions, particularly student-involved uh, student exhibitions at Brown, uh, mm -hmm. at the Public Humanities Center, at the Hafenreffer, and at the John Hay Library. Uh, he has a wide, I would say, a wide, enviably wide range of interests. History of museums and memorials, material mm -hmm. culture studies, mm -hmm not just a bit of material culture studies, but material culture studies to cool, and digital humanities, which is something that he shares with, uh, with David Jaffe. I also want to mention that he has a book coming out in the summer, and that book, which I can't, I honestly, I'm not just saying this, I can't wait to read, is called Inside the Lost Museum, Curating Past and Present, and that will appear in the summer. So, please join me in welcoming Stephen Luba. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, like the previous speakers, I just want to say a few words about David Jaffe, who invited us to, to speak. and who inspired the, some of the work that, that you've been hearing about this afternoon. Uh, David's historical work was on culture and commerce, and he approached those topics in both traditional ways, and especially in the last decade or so, a range of innovative new ways. Museum display, a material culture, new media, and interesting, and always an interest in pedagogy. So I've tried to be inspired by his work here to think about how to consider both historically and using new media one aspect of New York's commerce and culture. As you've heard already, David was very clear about the importance of collaborating with students and acknowledging their work. So let me thank uh, Emily Estin, my uh, research assistant on this project, um, 
and Stephanie Gomez, a computer science student at Brown who did some of the computer work, and of course the Brown University Center for the for Digital Scholarship, uh, who helped out made some of this possible. To say this work is inspired by and based on this one book, which you can see in the uh, in the exhibition next door. Um, it's the official catalog of the New York Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. I'll get to it later uh, in some detail, in excruciating detail perhaps. <laughs> um, but what I want to do is start off with the history of museum catalogs. That'll be the first part of the talk. Then I'll talk about exhibitionary culture in New York City in the 1840s <coughs> and 50s. Sort of the, the, so these are the two contexts of, of this catalog, sort of tracing it back in two different ways. And then I'll think about the ways that this catalog in the Crystal Palace redefined the museum catalog. And finally, I'll try to apply some new tools of digital humanities and think about this catalog as a database. Uh, see how we can say this is a database that we can explore in new kinds of ways. So the, the first topic, of course, is the catalog. And the big question here is, how do we describe an exhibition? An exhibition in real life are multimedia, multi-sensory places. They are full of objects that you can see in many different ways. You can describe in many different ways. Um, the objects are organized and displayed in a way that's important. You see them from different directions. You see them next to different things. Um, they can be behind uh, velvet ropes or they can be inside of cases. They can have people standing next to them explaining what's going on or in a place like the Crystal Palace uh, trying to sell you these things. Um, all of that is lost in the museum catalog. Also lost is the audience that you would participate with when you were at, uh, at an exhibition. Um, visitors and exhibitions are constantly making choices, constantly trying to figure out what to look at next, what to, what to, what to, to see, what to do. Um, none of that is captured in the museum exhibition catalog. They have a variety of purposes, though. For those who don't go to the fair or who are thinking about going to the fair, there are teas. You know, here's what you might see. Come and see this fair. Um, for those who visit, catalogs can be a guidebook. Here's what you can see as you <coughs> go through the fair. Um, they're useful after the exhibition, of course. You take them home to remember what you saw. Um, and if you can't make it at all, you can imagine the catalog for many exhibits as a stand-in. This is what happened, this is how we remember what's there. And of course, for historians, after the fact, it's very useful for understanding what went on. The, the thing that makes FAIR so interesting to look at is that they are a moment of carefully considered choices, a moment of a curated selection of objects that seemed worth saving, worth talking about, uh, worth showing off. So catalogs are very useful. Now, I, my next line of my talk is, there's not much written on museum catalogs. And this is the one audience that scares me to say that because <laughs> there probably are people here who know more about this. Uh, but there's very, I have yet to find a really good description of the, of the history. They are, um, mentioned the very first book about museums, uh, Samuel Kitchenberg's Inscriptiones of 1565, <coughs> mentions that if you have a collection, this is sort of a guide to collectors, uh, you might want a catalog of the books and coins in your collection, but not a public catalog. Uh, this famous picture that it has to be in every museum history talk um, <laughs> of the Ole Worms Museum, um, it's from a catalog of his collection published shortly after his death in 1654. Um, in some ways, it's the first thing that looks like a museum catalog that I know of. That's one of the things that makes this a modern museum. Uh, but it's more of a scholarly work of, that happens to be about the things in the, in the museum rather than about the museum. The first modern museum catalog, which is a checklist, a thing that um, Fritz Kears, who has written on the history of museum catalogs, writes, says this has all the essential features of a modern, a modern art museum catalog. That's from the Louvre, 1793. It has uh, a printed list of objects in the collection in systematic order. In this case, 
in the order that you would see things in the museum, and descriptions that facilitate identification of the objects by the public. This is what you would carry with you as you went through the museum. Now, the first museum catalog in the United States that I've been able to find is with really the first major museum in the United States, um, Peel's Museum in Philadelphia. <coughs> He says, he describes this in his 1796 catalog as a scientific and descriptive catalog of the museum. And his goals were to be, quote, as useful as possible and to excite a taste for the science of natural history. It was intended to be useful not only for those who visit the museum, but also to those who already, having some general acquaintance with natural history, may wish to give the subject a more particular attention. So this is really the catalog, like the worm catalog earlier, a uh, catalog is teaching tool. Uh, it was a textbook rather than just a guide to the exhibits, or at least as much as a guide to the exhibits. Uh, the other kind of, of catalog, this is a, maybe the second grand type. Um, this is 1821 catalog of the, uh, called the Catalog of the Articles in the Museum of the East India Marine Society. This is in Salem, <coughs> Massachusetts, one of the pre precursors of the Peabody Essex Museum of today. This is very different kind of use of a catalog. This is all of the objects in the collection in the order that they came to the museum with the donors listed, um, with some exceptions. Shells and, um, and minerals are listed in a scientific category by genus and species. Coins are listed in chronological order, except sort of fascinating Chinese coins, which have, are outside of history somehow and so have no <laughs> chronological order. Um, so this is really more of an inventory for the use of the museum to acknowledge donors than as a guide to visiting the, the museum. I think its purpose is probably as much to brag about the collections uh, as to explain them. Um, here in, in New York, um, in 1821, 1825 rather, the New York Anatomical Museum, which was part of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, published a guide to their collections. This is a, a third type of, of exhibition catalog. Let me quote from the introduction. Public utility and the advancement of science are the great objects of all cabinets. Every method, therefore, which may promote these ends should be adopted. That meant, first of all, good organization and explanation. And in this catalog here, which was aimed at students, quote, they may see what the collection contains and that they may know what they'd see. This is the sort of catalog you would carry into the museum and you would get an explanation. And here are the lovely things that you could see in, in the museum. Um, this is what students were learning about and medical students were learning about. So the most fascinating catalog that I had, not, had not known about before is this catalog from the Boston's 1845 Chinese Museum. This I think is a fourth type of catalog. This is a catalog that is a description of the exhibition itself. Um, it's the first one that I found that really does that. Um, it has on the sides here, I'll point out this wonderful expression, which I offered to the Bard Graduate Center as a motto. Um, it says, words may deceive, but the eye cannot play the rogue. You've got to see the truth by, by looking at actual objects. Um, so here's the, the point of this one is that uh, with the aid of this catalog, visitors will get a better knowledge of this curious people than can be acquired by reading the most faithful descriptions alone or even by a transient visit to China. Um, the Chinese Museum had several incarnations. It was in Philadelphia, it was then in Boston, it was in New York, uh, then moved to London. This gives you a sense of the scale. There's thousands and thousands of Chinese objects on display. Um, the museum directed visitors, the catalog, excuse me, directed visitors through the museum by numbered displays. Um, it described the dioramas in great detail. It said the, the descriptions are, um, let me go back to that. Uh, here's what you'll see. Um, uh, the diorama of Chinese mandarins, for example, 
uh, describes the meaning of their clothes, and then proceeds to discuss their training and education in China more generally. It included Chinese voices in the catalog, with quotes from Chinese writings and from travel writers, and ex excerpts from histories about China. It's 200 pages long, this catalog, and it was designed to serve as an introduction to China and Chinese history through the exhibition. Um, that, that's uh, the diorama of the, of the in, in one of the dioramas in the museum. Uh, the Natural History Museums have a separate tradition of catalogs. Um, this is the mineral catalogs are actually fairly common and look very modern uh, in shell collections. But most of the catalogs are this kind of thing. Uh, this is Spencer Baird, the uh, undersecretary of the Smithsonian, uh, present, does two books like this, Mammals of North America and Birds of North America. And he's um, using the collections to talk about the natural history of the continent. Um, he's not talking about the collections themselves. They are just uh, there to be used. So let me move now to the exhibitions of mid-century New York, the, the immediate context of the Crystal Palace and think about how they were portrayed in, in catalogs. David Jaffe gave a talk at the opening of an ex exhibit visualizing New York a couple of years ago. He said, 1850s New York was a visual experience, a spectacle. One of the key elements of that spectacle, one of the things that made the city modern, was the prominence of places where things were put on display. Modern stores offered arrays of objects for visitors to examine and to purchase. And many of these stores published catalogs and broadsides that would advertise what was there. Um, some of these were the sorts of places David wrote about, the visual culture. This is the um, Apple, Appleton's stereograph store. Uh, this is Appleton's bookstore. Again, museum-like spaces <coughs> with listings, with catalogs of what's on display. Um, Broadway, uh, Broadway Palace is what people talked about, these grand uh, emporia, the grand stores uh, that would look to my eye very much like a museum. Um, since Walt Whitman has to be in every talk, um, <laughs> uh, Walt Whitman writes this wonderful uh, description of these Broadway palaces. The, it goes on for pages with these descriptions of things you could buy on Broadway. Um, it struck me actually as a wonderful exhibition for the Bart Graduate Center someday. Um, there were not that many museums or art galleries in New York City before 1850. Uh, Carrie Ribora Barrett in her book on New York City exhibitions describes the new city in this period, she's talking about 1830s and 40s, uh, early 50s, as a place with very few experts mostly impromptu exhibitions and dubious auctions. There were two major art institutions, the American Academy of Fine Art and the National Academy of Design, but they didn't have their own buildings. They dis had displays in store windows, uh, hospitals, patrons' park parlors, and other spots like that. The National Academy did these occasional exhibitions and also occasional catalogs of these exhibitions. Uh, these were clearly intended to be carried as guides into the exhibition. Um, there are some that are simple explanations. And then many paintings given a little bit more context. In this case, a poem that you're supposed to read as you look at, at the painting. Uh, the Dusseldorf Gallery, which opened in 1849, uh, has a catalog of its the space, this is the, the, the Dusseldorf Gallery, it's quite wonderful. It put out a, a catalog of the paintings there that were, that were on display. And it's a very curious thing. It begins with 10 pages of descriptions from the, what it calls extracts of the press of New York that describe the exhibit. Mostly, basically all of the great reviews it got, they list them all in there. 
Um, and then for almost every painting, there's an excerpt from a, a review, a book uh, or a, a, an article about the exhibition that says why this is good and why you should like this painting. Um, um, you can get a sense of this here. The, this, the, the painting is described as admirable as a composition and full of lifelike and startling contrast. There is history and character in every personage. In some ways, this is a sales catalog for a market that is not quite sure what good art is. This is a way of describing what, what you might want to buy. Some paintings have several pages of this kind of description. Um, so these are, these are catalogs that are trying co to convince you of something. There were other kinds of exhibitions and museums in New York City behind Beyond Art, but the city was very aware that there was not enough here that there should be. In 1852, there's a New York Times article that says, there is nothing that strikes the foreigner with greater surprise than the total absence of anything like public institutions in the city of New York. In European cities, everywhere you go, there are public displays. There's museums, picture galleries, libraries, botanical gardens, zoological collections, free to all comers, and particularly interesting in tour to tourists. <coughs> New York, and I love this, the next great city of the world has only Barnum. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not completely true. There were a lot of museum-like places. Um, the, Phrenological Museum, the Fowler's Phrenological Museum, looked, was, you could get your head read there, but you could also go and just look at skulls and look at the, um, look at, at, at um, some of the models that they had. Um, in Brooklyn, and I'll get to this later, there was the Naval Lyceum. There were annual exhibitions. Uh, this is the American Institute in 1845. Um, it would have its fairs every so often. And there was Barnum. Barnum is always a challenge for museum history. It doesn't quite fit in our usual uh, ways of thinking about museum history. But like the other museums and exhibitionary spaces, Barnum put out a catalog. It's not surprisingly a little bit different from the others, although based in some ways perhaps on the, the Chinese museum. Um, it is, I should say, surprisingly mild-mannered for, for the reputation that the Barnum Museum has. Uh, it's a guide. It's, you can carry it through the exhibition. But it actually, I think, may have been designed for those who never made it to the show as well. Uh, the, it cost you 25 cents to get into the museum. You could buy the catalog for 12 and a half cents. Barnum made some good money either way. So it describes a visit to the museum rather than the museum itself. So you read things like, the power of the lodestone is shown to us in a very amusing manner. Or, in this room, the visitor sees kind of descriptions. So a non-visitor would get a clear sense of what it was like to visit the museum from, the, from this catalog. The Brooklyn Naval Lyceum was at the Navy Yard. Oops, that's another page from the, uh, from the Barnum catalog. Brooklyn Naval Lyceum was, may have well have been after Barnum the largest museum in New York. Um, nobody knows about it, uh, and it's one of my favorite unknown museums. Um, it was done by naval officers who would um, bring stuff back from around the world and put it on display at the Navy Yard in Brooklyn. It issued what I think is probably the, one of the longest catalogs of, of this era. Um, it's hard to find because it was issued in um, separate as articles in the U.S. nautical magazine, uh, but several hundred pages again total over a couple of years in the 1850s of uh, the iconographic catalog of, of, the, of the Lyceum. It is of the type <coughs> of catalog that is not so much about here's what you will see in the museum, but rather we will use the things in the museum to teach you about the world. Uh, it's an encyclopedic catalog rather than a, a guide catalog. There's another couple of pages to show you the sorts of things that were there. Um, so there's a quick background of the Crystal Palace into the scene of this modern US ex exhibitionary culture just getting started is, is 
enters the, the New York Crystal Palace. Um, you've heard a lot about it already, so I won't go into the details about the palace, but just to give you a sense of the ways in which it was uh, made available to the public. And of course, you can see this all at the exhibition next door. Must have been the most photographed, most described catalog uh, exhibition of any in the US to that day, uh, probably of any anywhere other than the London Crystal Palace. It was photographed, uh, material culture produced, uh, prizes given out. Um, there are about, according to the bibliography of the fair, there's at least 32 official and semi-official publications um, in a range of categories, um, opening a, uh, organizational materials, opening addresses, and the like. Um, I'm going to focus only on things that seem like museum catalogs, these um, the organizational materials and the uh, um, guides, and thinking about them as kinds of records and experiences of a museum-like exhibition. A uh, little bit of, of sort of backing off here, a little bit of theory, um, Lev Manovich uh, writes a wonderful article called Database as Symbolic Form. He offers a way to think about catalogs and guides as two kinds of ways of describing the world, as database and as narrative. Um, database and narrative, he writes, are natural enemies. Competing for the same territory of human culture, each claims an exclusive right to make meaning out of the world. He suggests that databases are a modern replacement for narrative. I think that in museum work, they have long been complementary. Let me start with, with a guide. This is a day in the New York Crystal Palace and how to make the most of it. Um, it's written by William Richards, who was also the editor of the official catalog of the fair. Um, he starts this guide with an introduction with an, uh, an introduction that compares the two forms of catalog. The official catalog, he writes, indispensable in itself as a complete and sim systematic inventory of the thousands of objects embraced in the Great Exhibition, is yet, in the very nature of the case, deficient in that sort of information concerning the chief attractions of the palace which the visitor requires which is a wonderful description of the comparison between the database and the narrative. This guide, Richard's guide, is designed to be carried with you as you go through the fair. Um, the bibliographer Coleman writes, you carry it, walk through, pausing here and there, to deliver, the, the describing this catalog, it says, delivers what now seem some very poor jokes and woefully inane puns, which is true. <laughs> Uh, he's trying to enliven what is really a very random selection of, of objects that you can see in the exhibition. It was designed so you could see as much as you can in the shortest time possible. Um, and it um, reveals just how odd the juxtaposition, juxtapositions of the fair must have been. Uh, a day at the Crystal Palace, this, this, this uh, exhibition, this, this guide was banned for sale at, at the palace. You weren't allowed to buy this there. And I'm not sure why that was. Um, perhaps by suggesting a path, it was defeating the very purpose of the fair, of, which was to be equally, having all of these things equally available. Um, it privileged some displays more than others. It might also have been taking <coughs> business, business away from the gentlemen who were selling their services as a tour guide. There was another uh, guide like this that took the other approach. It was a very commercial guide. Um, you bought an advertisement, your work was included in, in, the, in the guide to the fair. Um, one more quick look at another, oops, um, another of these guidebooks. Uh, this is a very opinionated, um, not an official take on things. Uh, it's happy to tell you what's good and what's bad. This comes from the, the second incarnation of the fair after P.T. Barnum took it over. Um, and it's very much a sense of, here's what I find interesting, here's what you should look at. Um, don't worry about seeing everything. 
So let's move on from, uh, oops, that's another description of the fair. So let's move on to the, to the more database-like uh, catalogs of the fair. We're gonna look at two of these. Um, the first is this fascinating, um, the world of science, art, and industry illustrated from examples of the New York exhibition. So this was not a guide to the fair. This was an encyclopedia, much like the Brooklyn Naval Lyceum uh, catalog, that was designed to build on the fair to teach you important things, um, give you a sense of the, <coughs> of the table of contents. Uh, it does, it's two things, and it's an odd book. It was printed in two separate ways. Some of it was printed live at the fair, just the pictures of things that were at the fair, and some of it was done separately, then they were merged together at the end. So that the two parts of the exhibition, you can see there, uh, of the, uh, the book on the left here is just a history of the cotton gin, and on the right, unconnected to it, are things you could see at the fair. Uh, these two kinds of catalog merged into one. Um, and then it had no advertisements, but what they would do to, to be able to sell this is that, um, to this for the other catalog, you could wasn't to, you couldn't buy an advertisement in the catalog itself. But you could buy a uh, an insert into it to uh, to sell to uh, to sell your goods at the fair. Okay, so now I want to go back to the catalog I started off that really inspired this talk. Um, this is the official catalog. Um, it's pure database. It starts, well, I should say, there is a separate catalog that came out a little bit later of the pictures at the fair, which I won't go into very much. The catalog is, has a map at the beginning, uh, two maps, uh, saying where each of the exhibits are. Um, so you can find your way around. But most of it is uh, listings by class or industrial group of the objects you could see. The, the catalog is first divided by country, and then within each country by, um, by industrial grouping. And you can see here the sorts of things and the, the categories that they had. Um, the editor gives instructions on how to use the catalog. Let me quote, the visitor should pursue, on passing through the building, the order in which it presents the countries. As an object meets his eyes, he will notice its class and serial numbers, and reference to the following pages will at once put him in possession of all the information that, all the information concerning the object. Seems an unlikely way that somebody would have used the fair. Um, we can imagine instead that the organization of the fair was really a way of promoting the goals of the fair. Um, the goals, the catalog states, were to draw forth such a representation of the world's industry and resources as would enable us to measure the strength and value of our own, while it indicated new aims for our enterprise and skills. So if you're concerned about commerce and trade and showing off the rest of the world, that's why you organize things by country rather than by category. the quote that I just read to you about how best to use it. Let me move on. This is a typical page of the catalog. Um, so this is under uh, the United States section. Um, descriptions, of what's there, where the people are, where they're from. Um, there's a, this is, goes on for hundreds of pages. You can see a wonderful exhibit technique next door with the pages and pages of this blown up on the wall over there. Um, let me end by just thinking about how we can use this as a pure database. Um, what my students have done is taken that very nice catalog, which turns out to be in pretty good shape when you do an optical character recognition search on it. You can clean it up and get a pretty good Google spreadsheet of 4,000 objects that were on display at the fair. Once you have that, you can start to play with it in all sorts of interesting ways. And this last part of the talk is really more, here's some possibilities, because we're still trying to, to get this all done. But 
I'll end with just a few of those possibilities. Um, so this is the, where we were. This is organized by, as it was in the catalog, the, uh, the official printed catalog, by <coughs> country and then uh, by um, category. And I've color coded some of these to make it a little bit easier to figure out what's going on. But you get a very different sense of things if you organize it by category and then by country. And you get a different feel of what was really there. You can start to understand it better. As you start to, to code it, you start to see some of the groups of things that were there and what wasn't there. And you can start to see that sort of visually becomes apparent in that catalog. You can start to, to analyze it statistically. Who was really there? Um, you see about half was US, um, a big chunk Germany and the UK, and then a few um, outliers. You could also start to get a sense of where things are located there, because each item has the place on the map. And I won't, I have, I can show this live, but I can wait to do that later. Um, one of my students has pulled together this where you can say, show me all the things from the United States in, or in this case, from Germany, or all the things in this category, and where would you see these things? So you can start to get a feeling for what it would be like in the, in the fair. Um, uh, trying to get a sense of more detailed localities. Now, some of the data starts to fall apart when we do this, but um, where are there places with lots going on? Of course, New York City uh, is the single highest, but you can start to get a feel of this. I've also started to make some maps of where things are. Um, organized here by category, so the colors represent um, the different types of things on display. And you can start to see where they are, uh, what, what countries, what parts of the United States are producing, what kinds of, of, uh, of goods for display. And finally, you can start to see uh, some of the ways in which different countries show off different categories of their goods. Um, again, the colors show the different kinds of, of things on display another way of pursuing that. Um, finally, there's a project that I'm trying to figure out. Many of the, um, of the entries say that there's an agent involved. Agents are mostly from New York, but not all of them. And who are these agents? What was their role? There's about um, manufacturers. We can start to play with this data in a way to, to understand that as well. Um, this gives us a sense of the density in New York City. Uh, there are addresses for many of these, um, which are a little bit difficult to use, but you can start to get a sense of where industry was in New York City at the time. And uh, finally, all of the agents, all of the, the, um, of the entries shown uh, by, by place. So that gives you just a sense of what it is that I'm uh, trying to play with, thinking of this as database, sort of going back to the, this original sense that the compiler of the catalog must have had of, I wish I had a computer to, to do this work better. <laughs> Thank you. Before we, before we move on to the general discussion, uh, I think there's time just for a couple of pressing questions. Yes. Yes. Um, I appreciate all this research. Is I mean, how far <coughs> with it. So I'm wondering, would, could you pull out for us um, which countries or which um, innovations came about uh, significantly during that time? Um, so the important inventions at, on display at the fair, um, Sort of a mishmash of what's important to the to the to the country, and, and there's the historical writing about the fair suggests that in fact it was not a very it did not really show off the, the most important American inventions of the day. Singer sewing machine was there, one of the key things. Um, uh, the cotton gin was there, but things like machinery and locomotives were not part of the fair, and that that was missing from from. It may have not just may have been not easy to get that on onto display. Uh, the, what comes in from around the world is quite spotty, again, tied to agents who want to sell things in New York City. This was 
designed not to show off German or British industry generally, but to be thinking about how to sell these to a new audience in the, in, in the United States. So it would be something that can be transported, transitioned. Very much. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, I didn't quite hear that first question. Speak up. Maybe I'm overlapping. Oh, okay. But I'm sorry. I was wondering, do you know anything about the, <coughs> the organizers of the exhibition and how they chose those people and what? I mean, I understand what you've, you've plucked out mm -hmm. from all of this data, but but why was it that way? My. I think I'll turn that over to some of the students who turn that over to some of the students who worked on that project, who will know much more about that than I. Uh, it was open. They tr they encouraged lots of uh, of uh, manufacturers to send their material. Uh, there were agents that were sent to England and Germany to encourage uh, companies to provide material for the fair, but there was not a. Uh, I, I haven't seen the letters saying, here's what you will get out of it by, by <coughs> being here. I, just to follow up, mm -hmm. I mean, it looked like it was at least half American. Yes. Uh, whereas in the Crystal Palace in London, what's the, I'm just curious about what the, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know the percentage. Half British, so the same. Was it half British? Mm -hmm. half. One more. Okay. I think one more before our general discussion. Yes, at the back. Um, I'm wondering if you know how much the guidebook cost, and was it, or was it part of the admission? Where could you buy it? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, the big guidebook, the illustrated guidebook that I showed briefly, was a very expensive book to buy. Uh, and in fact, the first three or four pages are the publisher saying why this book is so expensive, <laughs> how much it costs to produce. Uh, I spent $40,000 to make this book, uh, so you should appreciate it. My, I don't know where you'd buy the, 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 the guides, I assume, except for that one that I know is not available for sale. You'd want to buy this at the at the catalog at the exhibition. Uh, on the other hand, it would also serve if you were a manufacturer or an importer. You would want this as a reference work later on as well. So, what was the publication run? If you uh, is there any oh, idea? Publication runs are always very hard to tell for books. Um, so, I don't know the answer. Let's thank Steve Lubar for this wonderful talk. <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, him and Amy Ogata to come up to the table where my colleague Catherine Whalen, uh, who also teaches here at Bar Graduate Center, will moderate a discussion. And I'm very thankful to be able to pass the talking <laughs> stick to her. Absolutely, I'm delighted to take it. <laughs> Well, um, I just want to re re reiterate the welcome. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here, um, both from the Broad Graduate Center community and outside. Um, and I think David would be especially pleased to be able to share uh, this afternoon with you as well as the exhibition. Um, I think you have a sense of how many people, um, one of the really nice things about this event is hearing from those people about their roles in the exhibition. Um, and I, I can say, I think David would be outwardly modest, but, you know, is it not, not loud enough? Yeah. I think David would have been outwardly modest, um, but inwardly very pleased and proud, um, as is often his way. Um, as someone outside looking in, um, I could say he, he always commented on the intellectual creativity of the students in his classes, um, and that's really the perspective I know. Um, and uh, their, the questions they raised, the topics they wanted to address, and the, the interpretive solutions they proposed. Um, so I wanted to then uh, thank uh, also Amy and Steve for offering us these really um, broader historical, geographic, and cultural perspectives that allows us to think through um, the New York Crystal Palace, uh, both in New York and in the world beyond it. And I'd like to ask both of you uh, to start off with, are there questions that you have for each other? <laughs> I have a question. Well, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> because there's this great <laughs> illustrator, the, 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 the architects create this, this book which is a big project. It's got this great gilded cover. It's, they've sunk some money into doing that as a kind of testimony, and they include all this correspondence about payments, and it's clear that they're making some kind of case for themselves. 
do we know why they would go to such extent? I mean, the, some of those those sections and the, the parts, all of that is, you know, these are incredibly elaborate foldouts that are part of of, uh, of the book, including also some lithographs. Yeah. So I don't know. So here's here's. Let me just read the the what they say in in the beginning. Um, in excess of $40,000 in capital letters to produce this. They went on to proclaim its general and permanent value, the present exhibition being used merely to furnish a text and examples for the illustration of general principles. They hired the most famous scientist in America, Benjamin Silliman, to write the text, uh, had no connection to the fair, and the part of it that he wrote it's really a general <coughs> history of industry, of technology, of science of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think they were thinking of this as a grand encyclopedia mm -hmm. that was hooked to the fair to, to sell it. Yeah. It's a good yeah. question. It's a, it's no, a beautiful book. It is. Well, there's the Silliman book, but then there's the architects also create one, ah. which is just about the building. And so it's, there's this proliferation of books about, about yeah. this event. But there's, a, there's in all these examples, and you certainly made that, that clear, that the agendas are totally different. They all have different, you know, something else that they want to live on after the exhibition is over. And for the architects, it seems to be something really personal. Can I address that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, because basically, uh, the, the fair uh, went way over budget, yeah. or the building. Right, the building. Went way over budget. Right. And, and, yeah. and they had to postpone the opening date by a month and a half, I believe, at least. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of recrimination and blaming and, <laughs> and, and uh, trying to, the organizers of, of, the, of the Crystal Palace were trying to blame the architects. So they felt that they needed to defend themselves. Yeah. So they not only wanted to write a book about, literally about building the, the building, all the design and engineering decisions that went into it, but offer their own very lengthy and detailed explanation of why all these problems That's, happened. Yeah. And to basically absolve themselves of the blame that they felt had been unfairly yeah. put upon them by the organizers of, of, of the organizers right. of the of the uh, exhibition. Yeah, I, I, that that I that I got. But it's like this what why that <laughs> gilded cover? You know, it's like why why put that much money into a kind of defense, uh, you know, is it something about the book? You know, I guess this yeah, is my question, question, really. Is it is it that the, the book itself is this kind of tangible thing that after, you know, after all, everything else? <coughs> I, I'd like, um, if our members yeah. of our audience could introduce themselves. So yeah. we just yeah. heard from Sheila Maloney, who is a student here at our Graduate Center that worked on the exhibition, and now we're going to hear from you, Ed. Uh, my name is Ed Bukowski, and I, I wrote a book uh, on the Crystal Palace, and I can unravel the mystery of the architect's relationship with the board of directors and the engineers. Uh, the original plan <coughs> called for a basement uh, for more exhibit space, and immediately to cut costs, the ba basement was eliminated. And as the building uh, was uh, being built, it became a, they became aware that they needed more exhibit space. So at the last minute, the, they had to negotiate with the, with the architects to design this new space, which basically was a machine, arcade, and, and the uh, uh, art gallery. Um, and uh, between uh, negotiating how much they should get paid and being blamed uh, for, there were actually two deadlines. It was originally a May 1st. And then there was a June 1st, and then the final date was, was July 14th. So right from the beginning, the architects had a, a, uh, a problem with the board of directors, yep. a problem with the engineers that they worked with, and they also had a problem with a lot of people who re were resentful of foreigners designing our American Crystal Palace. Mm -hmm. uh, both were here less than two years, uh, they emigrated to this country, so there was uh, some, some public opinion that, that was against them. Uh, and um, I think they just did a wonderful job, and what's unique about their book is that they have like, well I would call it inter-office correspondence yeah. between uh, Mr. Sedgwick and, yeah. and uh, their office about being paid. Uh, they didn't get you know, the money that they needed to continue with the work on the new plans for the new design. So they had poor press coverage right from the beginning, and I mm -hmm. think this was a book to defend mm -hmm. themselves. Right. 
Hmm. Must have cost them a fortune, though. <laughs> oh, oh, and when you say the gilt cover, and the color illustration in the book that is many times removed is probably the best example and the brightest example of the uh, of the time of chromolithography. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautiful mm -hmm. example of the New York Palace. Mm -hmm. But I could go on and on and on and on. It's a great historical record, so I'm glad mm -hmm. they did it. Like yeah, it. right. Uh, well, that's it. Yeah. It's called an illustrated description of the building. I think yeah. that's, that's uh, what it's called. Looks like we have another question. Right Hello, uh, I'm Jeffrey Coulter. I'm director of the Peabody Museum at Harvard. Not the one in Essex. I'm also a research fellow here uh, this term. I'm very happy for it. Um, I'd like to offer a comment and then a question. And the comment is I'm uh, at the Peabody. We're actually in the final stages of a new exhibit on the history of anthropology and the role of the museum in the uh, anthropological displays at the World Columbia Exposition of 1893 in Chicago. And what I'm struck by is the difference in the Crystal Palace and that, in which the buildings were mostly gym crack and done very speedily, yet at the same time, uh, the role of Putnam and the Midway in a carny like atmosphere, but nonetheless, this introduction of the other and the foreigner in, in all of those exhibits that Boaz down the street was involved in and so forth. Yeah. So I'm just interested in comments on what happened to that dramatic change. Was it just those personalities or what else was going on? My question's a rather mundane one, um, and that is, what was the long-term plan as of, say, 1854 for the Crystal Palace in New York? And given that it burned down, I read somewhere that it was arson, or has that been revised? Thank you. Um, um, you want to ask me? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Monday. Yeah. yeah. Beginning to blush now. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it, 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 it probably was arson. They did see somebody running from uh, the entrance on, uh, on 42nd Street. Uh, and uh, that entrance was closed at the time, but it was used to store old lumber. Um, and right outside the storage unit was a display of, of turpentine and chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just very convenient uh, for this person, as far as the studying I've done, to this for this to be ignited. Uh, and it, uh, it just, once it uh, reached the fabric of the dome, that, that was that was that was the end, uh, and also reaching the second floor uh, wooden flanking and decking, uh, uh, and it just caught between the, the chemicals and that it just it just caught right on fire, and, and then coincidentally they were testing the waters from the Croton Reservoir, so the water pressure inside the Crystal Palace was zip. So, um, but but two thousand people were inside the building and. Uh, the issue of the New York Times of them describing the people in their panic leaving the building uh, tells the story of one last little girl in, in one of that, those period hats with the ribbons coming down and that was saved from the, from the uh, platform of the stairway and taken out of the building. But no one, no one was killed. And incidentally, five days later, Tiffany dug up at Jules for, for its store. <laughs> And, and, and Steve, oh, I'm sorry, Eddie. Okay. No, I'm no, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, like I said, I could go on and on. But I think the building was intended to be purchased after it was raised, and they, the, the city refused to actually buy it, and so they weren't sure what to do with it, and that's exactly. when this, we had this kind of idea. And there were a lot of afterwards. proposals in the future. Right. Oh, and then to the question of uh, in 1855, there was a black man's uh, convention held in the Crystal Palace. Now, I don't know if that meant that uh, uh, the African-American was allowed entrance during the 1853 and 1854 uh, you know, season, but I do know that there were functions for the African-American held in the Crystal Palace. <laughs> Have the exhibits been removed by them? No, many of them, uh, they couldn't afford to remove the exhibits because it was too costly. So, um, so consequently, when, uh, when Horace Greeley, who was then on the board of the 1854 Crystal Palace, went over to see the 1855 Paris exhibition, he was arrested by some French <laughs> exhibitors who had their stuff still in the Crystal Palace. Yeah. Eleanor, do you want to contribute? Thank you. Uh, I'm Eleanor Lee, and I'm a 
some time in a month's staff here. I actually wanted to get back to the question that uh, Professor Booker asked, because I think it's a really interesting one. It's very striking for those of us who have an interest in rural spares. And Amy, I thought maybe you would be especially uh, interested in that term. The, the contrast of the style of architecture between those two fair, fairs is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And it's especially interesting, I was thinking about it as you presented all these other crystal palaces that were happening you know, over the span of a number of years. Now it's true that the Columbia Fair, the structure was iron, uh, but it was but it was made to look as if it was staff, you know, made with staff and stuff, but to look at this elaborate style. But I just wonder if you might address yeah, it was made to look Roman. It was yeah. made to look ancient, and yeah. it was made to you know this the city on the, the lake um, uh, that had come back from a terrible fire, um, and so there's this image of permanence, um, of a gleaming um, the the new world taking on the best you know the clothing essentially of yeah. of the past of the of the old world, um, and you know presenting itself as this kind of gleaming ideal city with the canals and elaborate waterworks and bridges. Um, so it, it became a kind of spectacle. So the, the, the buildings um, were all part of a plan, right? So this, there's an urban planner who's involved in this, um, who is, um, you know, trying to create something spectacular, right, um, as its own entertainment. So the iron, by the 1890s, um, the idea of iron buildings, you know, is old. It's old-fashioned, uh, and that's not at all um, what Daniel Burnham is interested in. Actually, Steve, do you want to respond yeah, to that Let me just, well? yeah. just say a little bit about that. The, the difference between the 1850s fairs and the 1893 ones are really quite dramatic, like you say. And I think that the 1850s fair are really late examples of mechanics fairs. So New York City has this whole annual run of mechanics fairs. Um, Philadelphia has them, Boston has them. And their displays are they're really places to show off what you're selling. And the Crystal Palace, both of them in some ways, fit right into that. Um, 1876 is a little bit different, although it's mostly still that. It has some historical work as well. And by 93, it's not only a different architecture, it's a completely different sense of uh, what you should see there. So it has the machinery hall still, but that's a small part compared to all the other things that are going on. Including those popular amusements yeah. that you made reference to, and the yeah. involvement of the Smithsonian, actually. Right. Right. <laughs> the Peter, are there other questions? Thanks. Uh, Peter Miller. Uh, I guess this could be for either, but I was thinking, uh, Steve, about your uh, juxtaposing the catalog with the different uh, museum or museum-like things. And you've kind of come around to it just now in your answer, but um, I was wondering about the, the different afterlives of the two crystal palaces. The one in London having such an important effect on shaping of applied arts, museums, mm -hmm. um, craft movements, whereas it seems like the New York one was entirely commercial. Was there no one trying to, to emulate the British on that side of things? No, they, they talk <laughs> about that. They, that the British one, of course, is, has a government a royal connection. And they're very proud. This is a purely, purely commercial fair. This is not, um, no, no government money goes into this, they say. But, no, but, but uh, also no private sector aspiration for enhancing uh, metropolitan glory. I, I, well, the metropolitan glory, yes, but the, the arts and in industry, not so much. I mean, it was to say New York, the next great city of the world, but it was on a commercial basis rather than on a larger artistic basis, I think. Yes. I'm, oh, hi. <laughs> I'm Eliza de Solomon as an independent art scholar. Um, my question was uh, when Amy uh, had spoken earlier about Paxton and about um, there was conversation about enchanted spaces. But I wanted to say something more on the practicality of the search for light and uh, for daylight. And if you think, you know, a few years ago, Cooper Hewitt did an exhibition of paintings by windows, the whole need for light. And here you all of a sudden have this massive space with light and where you can display everything in this incredible crystal light, sunlight. And so I just wanted to, and of course you have skylights at that time, which go right into the early 20th century, the, the use of skylights and the excitement of a skylight. 
So I just I I wanted to note that, and also wanted to ask you about Madrid, because Madrid had one as well, which I just saw this last year, and I wanted to ask you about Madrid. Uh, yeah, I don't know about Madrid, <laughs> so maybe somebody else in this room so, does. Yeah, um, how that fitted into the picture of this of the listing of all the different. There are, are there are world's fairs. I mean, so they what starts there are uh, product exhibitions and industrial fairs and mechanics fairs. Right. Um, through from the eight, eight, late 18th century, um, to the middle of the 19th century, and what distinguishes this tradition that we see right. starting in 1851 and then continuing on is um, a desire for a kind of a different model of commerce. So instead of it being local national products but it being something international. And so free trade, which is a new idea in the 1850s, is something that is, is uh, offered up in this, you know, in this object world that is put on view. Um, and so it, in quick succession, um, seeing the success of the Crystal Palace, which actually made money, had a surplus, uh, and got a ton of, uh, of attention, um, it, all of these other countries were seeking to do this some version of this um, over, and, and they changed. They changed really dramatically um, as a tradition. Um, I don't even remember the date of Madrid. It's not. Um, it's fascinating. It's still there. Yeah, but what it's is the date of it? I think it's later, though, isn't it? I, I mean, it's 1870. Oh, it's the 70. Okay. Yeah, but it was a green. Well, it's a, it is a greenhouse. Yeah. Okay. So it is in a. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, aren't they all greenhouses? <laughs> <laughs> So, Ed, you had a comment? You uh, to yeah, I was going to make a comment on the effects that the New York Crystal Palace had on maybe some of the residents of uh, New York City. And I often think about the school children who were allowed to, to come into the Crystal Palace and see the Crystal Palace and what an advantage they had in 1853 and 1854 to see the world and to see this country uh, and to be inspired by that. Um, let alone women <coughs> who were inspired by um, other things in the in the Crystal Palace, uh, the sewing machine exhibit that get, that gave them swatches of cloth that that they couldn't believe the stitches were so perfect, uh, or inventors that went into the in, into the machinery arcade and said that you know I can improve on that invention just by seeing just by seeing this in in, in front of them. So I, I really think it affected you know almost every every visitor that would, that went in there, and I think especially the children um, uh, from those two years in, 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 mm -hmm. in New York City. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to comment about that about visitor response to these kinds of events, exhibitions? Not necessarily just the Crystal Palace, but other accounts. It's always so hard to know what visitors yeah, think, and yeah. I, I'm sure there are letters, and clearly New York, t the articles in the newspaper talk about that. But the, the big mystery in all of these things is: so you see it, what effect does it have on you later in life? Was there any notable designers or, or architects that were influenced by things that went on in, the, in, hmm. these, in these particular things? Yeah, it's <laughs> a long story, so, but yeah, so, it's a whole. Yeah. I'm saying they actually attended and then yeah. began yeah. I don't know about New York. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. There's only the British and the French ones. Yeah. Yeah. Question back here. Uh, Debbie Waters. I, I work with the uh, Cooper Hewitt graduate mm -hmm. program. Uh, to what extent were <coughs> exhibits supposed to be new? So many of the objects had been shown, say, in London and particularly the British silver of something I've been interested in. And then they're shown here in New York, or in one case, uh, 1835, Boston piece of silver is being shown in 1853 in New York. So was there any requirement that things be new? My impression is that it was strictly up to the exhibitors and that most of them were eager to show off their latest products. I mean, this was, it's really more of a, of a sales hall to think about it rather than as a mm, historical exhibition. Mm -hmm. So that you would go there and you would see what was, what you might want to import or what you might want to buy. Um, you might show off historical things, older things to show, look at the beautiful things or how long we've been in business. But mostly it's about 
um, here's what you can buy from us today is what most of them are after. And there are, there are classifications of, of various materials from raw to finished. Uh, and they use the same one in New York that they used in, in Britain. Um, so this, the organization of the fair also has says something about the kinds of products um, and kind of privileges the, the finished object. Um, although, you know, the, the raw, you know, parts of it also you know, are these sites of wonder um, and information. So do you want to come up more about the, how the database project that you did um, changed, perhaps? Or what insights did it reveal about um, content or display? Yeah. Or so the main thing that, well, the, the geographical mapping is really quite fascinating. Um, and in some ways, there's no grand surprises to know that the South is mostly producing raw materials, and New York City is full of the cutting edge daguerreotypes and that, and that kind of thing. You get a sense of the categories that surprised me, things like the number of musical instruments on display. Mm -hmm. A lot of German musical instrument makers must have seen the U.S. as a great market for, the, for, their, for their goods. Um, you get a sense, what I came away with was a sense that a few agents were very interested in selling off certain kinds of things. So there is a collection from Newfoundland that is clearly a variety of, of things from Newfoundland, but are all brought together by one New York City agent. Uh, things from British Guiana, uh, these sort of outliers that you won't see until you start picking apart the, the database. Uh, that's the sort of thing you can get from, from understanding it that way, I think. My name is Georgiana Hensler. I'm just a fan of the Crystal Palace. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about uh, influences of were any architects influenced by what was there? Well, oh, this elevator introduced the elevator. Mm -hmm. And that concept was quite new. And when you think of the influence that had on future architects ready right the high rise. You know, it was kind of born with the Otis elevator, which in the beginning people were deathly afraid of and they wouldn't even set foot on it there. But that was introduced there. So there were some firsts at the uh, Crystal Palace that in some cases were quite mundane, but in other cases where you could see where the, the, the genesis of some of the greater uh, uh, events that were coming and, and the, the uh, future for technology and architecture and a lot of that was there and it was an introduction of these things to the common man uh, because without his acceptance those things were not going to flourish and this was a way of introducing them on a more understandable level and I think you talk about first overseas versus in England versus over here well people didn't have television and the internet just because it was introduced in England as a first <coughs> didn't mean that people over here knew about it. It was still going to be a new first mm -hmm. over here. So many of the things that were at the London Crystal Palace were reintroduced to this side of the pond and the New York Crystal Palace. John Ward had a silver for Sotheby's. How could we know how commercial this was? I mean, could you buy things out of the exhibition like the May in the 1890s? Were people taking orders on the floor? I think so I think no to the first question and yes to the second. I think that they were very much there to take orders and and to, to set up a, a way to sell things locally. And was there a sell-off of the once it closed for the first round, was there a sell-off then of this material that been imported over that people didn't want to turn down. I, mean, I know St. Louis, for instance, there was a big sell-off of things, you know, I guess at the end. To that. There was a, a public auction when mm -hmm. it closed, and mm -hmm. that, and that the number of goods were in fact sold, but they weren't sold during the line there from the floor. The later years, mm -hmm. by 1855. Yeah, <coughs> you could actually buy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and when, excuse me, and when uh, President Pierce was at the inauguration on the 14th of July, um, he ordered the uh, the White House dinnerware set from a dealer inside the Christmas. Uh, Matthew Jennings from the University of Oregon. I, I really am struck by how distinctive this the Christmas Palace um, exhibition seems to be compared to other world's fairs. 
and in fact, you know, it really was, I hadn't really thought about it as a World's Fair exactly um, until today, but it seems, it, it seems very distinct. Um, and so my question is, was there any, was it just a commercial fair? I mean, I know that's a lot, but, um, or was there any kind of um, sense of a, of a kind of um, uh, reason for calling it some historical reference? Um, afterward, it seems to me, all of them seem to require that. In Philadelphia in 76, mm -hmm. in, uh, in 1893, uh, the ones in the West Coast, in Portland, say, and other places. Um, so, and, and I just wondered, so the, the big pivot here, just to maybe state the obvious, is the Civil War. And, um, and, and, and during the Civil War, the sanitation fair certainly had a kind of a political uh, narrative attached to them, as well as these other objectives. So I, I guess my question is, um, the, the, the fairs afterwards would continue to have their commercial and booster purposes, um, but they would usually have some kind of, um, um, uh, I don't know, patina of, of historical significance. But it, it, it seems like in, 15, in, in 1853, that wasn't the case at all. That is my impression. In the, the London one does have this patina of we will improve the quality of goods. Um, the 1876 one is about the centennial. The 1893 one is about Columbus. This one does not seem to have that. It really is a mechanics fair done, done over. Yeah, and by 1867, there's actually a historical history of work. That's one of the exhibits in, in the circular okay. fair that you can walk around mm. and see not only the new things, but also a selection of historic objects. He's mm. wondering. It's like, you know, it's workmanship, really, is what they mean. It's Ivan Gaskell again. I wonder to what extent the presence of, or the consequences of slave enslaved labor was either masked or made apparent in the exhibits. I have seen nothing in the catalogs that mentions it. Um, the in, in the published book about the fair, the, the big picture book, um, <coughs> there's a lengthy description of the cotton gin and talks a good bit about slavery, but it's not connected to the fair particularly. Um, there certainly are southern manufacturers who are selling their things there, um, but it's a good question and it would be well worth seeing if there's any mention of it. I, I don't remember seeing anything. Are there northern products, manufactured products? that are made with raw materials that are Almost, produced yes. by enslaved people. Right. Are there, are, I'm wondering if the students have any thoughts about that, since you were involved in thinking through the African-American experience. Um, well, I see Laura, I think, has left. Is that right? I was working on that. Are there other people who want to address that question? Mm, I, I just want to interject that there was a competition won by a woman uh, in upstate New York, uh, and she created an abolitionist book that was on display at the uh, New York um, Our person in the back, and then I think Deborah after that. Um, London and New York, lots of natural light. We're both necklaces ghastly. There is gas in the New York yeah. one. Um, there is gas, uh, but I don't know that it's lit at night. It was set up for it. I think it may have been used occasionally. I'm sure you have a at, at the New York museum. Yeah. No, it was uh, it was specifically um, installed. I think around the same time as uh, they installed the heaters to keep it open the first okay. winter. winter. Uh, and they wanted the effect at night from the glowing of the gas lights. Right in combination with the, with the painted dome. Um, and um, uh, they, they did use it uh, often. And there, and there were more gas lights in the building of the Crystal Palace than there were on the streets of New York at the time. Mm -hmm. And the London Strip. Uh, I don't think there was gas lighting use in the London Crystal Palace, no. as no. far as I understand. Deborah. I, you know, I, it doesn't seem to have a lot of resonance, um, actually. Um, it's un I, I think it doesn't get that much press um, that other places like Munich, uh, the Germans, you know, southern 
German regions, it's not yet Germany, but, uh, and the French are very busy on their own fare. Uh, I don't know that they make that much comment actually <coughs> on it. Um, so later on, Siegfried Gideon, who's so enthusiastic about iron construction and about fairs, in Space, Time, and Architecture um, in 1941, he publishes this kind of extended comment on the history of exhibitions, and he includes the Crystal Palace, the, the New York Crystal Palace, and he says something like, the building is you know, not noteworthy at all. Uh, <laughs> he's completely dismissive of it, even though he's such a, a great champion of this type. Um, he's left cold. Um, but so. he did really single out Bogardus's design. Yeah, he absolutely did. Yeah, that would have been, yeah, would have been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, the <laughs> warehouse. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, so much was published in New York that had national circulation. So Harper's Magazine covers the fair in great depth. And so it would have had national circulation from that. But I don't know that it made, that any, you know, Boston, I'm sure, was, was eager to have its own sort of, they, they thought they were important too, so <laughs> it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't get that, it doesn't get the same press that the one in London does. But also, can I just add that there was not another World's Fair in New York until 1939. And even in the 1890s, when there was some discussion about bringing a World's Fair to New York and P.T. Barnum was involved, he basically said, we've never had anything like this. So it, I, I feel like it really just kind of fell off the radar. Yeah. It, it was a financial failure, and I think it just kind of fell off the radar very, radar very quickly and just was kind of almost forgotten, even by the person who was one of its big promoters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's why I call my book The Lost History of the New York Crystal Palace, because <laughs> it's been basically ignored. Um, and uh, it was part of the movement uptown and initiated the uh, movement uptown. Uh, uh, I just, uh, it just had a tremendous effect on, on, on New York in many ways. Poor Christopher. <laughs> 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 I'm Jill Fanishel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've written about Uncle Tom's cabin ceramics. And I think one little tiny blip that seems to collide in my mind is that Harriet Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's cabin in 18. So 1853, I think there are a lot of the industrial products that kind of reflected um, or mirrored elements in the book. And though, to answer someone's question about slave work being organized and recognized within the fair, I do not think that there was that. I do think there was this abolitionist tone to the fair in New York. And I think that one of the reasons that the fair was not really held in memory very long, and was very quickly followed by this humongous war, and it just absorbed all of that kind of mid-century intellectualism and thought about future and past. Everyone just suspended their beings for, for many years. So that's just my two cents on that. So Steve, I don't know if you ever got to ask Amy your question. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> my question was about the colors. Mm -hmm. So the, the London Crystal Palace is bright colors. It's blue and green and yellow, sort of shockingly un-Victorian in some ways, I think, maybe. Or entirely. Or entirely. Yeah. But, but yeah. It, it, just, it just stands out as, as sort of very mechanically bold. Mm -hmm. uh, and where do those colors come from? What are they? Well, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about, um, so the the interior is painted. Um, the interior of the New York Crystal Palace was also mm -hmm. painted, and that was part of this whole dispute, as, yeah. as you know. Um, the, uh, the London one was created by Owen Jones, who was part of a group around Henry Cole, who were very much concerned about design um, and manufacture, but also about uh, the importance of some of these aesthetic decisions. And Jones, in particular, was had a a pet interest in chromatic theory. Um, he was someone who was an architect, who was also a lithographer. Um, he was tremendously interested in the Alhambra. Uh, and he is the one who writes the Grammar of Ornament, right, 1856. It's the compendium of the ornament of the world, essentially, and time, uh, in the wake of uh, 
the Crystal Palace exhibition. Um, and he was hired, and what he was working with was the series of primary colors, a red, yellow, and blue on the different ribs with white in between, uh, to give it what he called a neutral bloom. Um, there's this idea of a kind of chromatic harmony that he was hoping to uh, give the viewer in this ex this otherworldly experience, a, sp an exp a spatial experience unlike um, what they were fami familiar with. And so he had this whole scheme uh, for painting that interior to create this sensation, this optical sensation. But I have a question for you. Uh, Heather Jane McCormick, who many of you probably do know, told me at one point that, that, that Silliman had had objects daguerreotyped in the preparation of his catalog. Yes. Is that right? Yes, he yeah. says in the catalog that every engraving is done from daguerreotypes. And I wondered if there are Where any are they? Yes, <laughs> I wondered the same thing. Yeah. But they do brag about that. Okay. And I don't know if that was the common way of doing of engravings at that point or not. But that seems that very they, they brag about it. Labor and uh, intensive. And, and I think yeah. this was all done live. You could go and watch them do this, was my impression. Wow. That this was live at the fair. You could watch them daguerreotype it. You could watch them engrave it and watch them print it. Mm -hmm. And so it was advertising for the publisher, I think. Yeah. Part of this, um, David's larger project, was thinking about New York as cultural capital, both of production and taste making. Mm -hmm. And daguerreotypy was one of the things he was particularly interested in, and how this um, both captured, but then became the, the mode for other form imagery and other forms of production. Um, he was also particularly interested in furniture, uh, so um, the and printmaking. Um, and you can see that right in the exhibition; those those points of interest um, that he's subtly directing your attention to and that the students explored more fully in their essays. We have two. Okay. I just want to make a comment on the reception of the fair. Um, I have an example in the master's thesis that I did for Bard here, uh, which was a study of collecting and consumer culture through the library of a figure who lived in Montclair, New Jersey. So really the catalog, the uh, official catalog, finds the, a place in this uh, collection, which extends all the way into the early 20th century. But the owner of this house and library would have been just 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So I don't have proof that he acquired it when he was 14, but it has his personal stamp. <coughs> and when I wrote my paper, I looked at this as like the first uh, in a series of steps that led to the full bloom of his consumer and collecting culture, oh, nice. you know, with catalogs going, especially in the 1890s, as collections were dispersed from famous figures, uh, but through newspaper clips, I think that this was like the earliest example that I sort of hinged the uh, thesis on in terms of collecting behavior. So it, it would have influenced him. It, maybe he acquired it a little bit later, but it's likely that he would have visited at age 14, he's someone who was bringing him himself up by the bootstraps and went to Cooper mm -hmm. Union in New York. So he did mm -hmm. everything possible to inform himself about culture mm -hmm. and then eventually becomes a banker with some means. Mm -hmm. So catalogs lead to more catalogs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the database. Right. <laughs> so I don't know how prevalent you know, to yeah. find a no, catalog right. like, like this mm -hmm. in an institute in a collection. Yeah. Has I don't know how many survive. I've, there are a few that, if you look up in the library system, there are some that are out there. But I, how many were printed? Somebody asked before. How yeah, many no, were okay. saved? I, I, and I really don't know. And it's not the sort of thing that would have been useful five years later. So right. it's not something you would keep forever as a beautiful thing. No, um, it wasn't. So I know. I was, I yeah. was where, you know, where are the illustrations? Right. This is not helping me much. No, but it's, it's it was just in a list. Science and a yeah. collector for both microscopical instruments and things like that. So, so there was a whole have, scientific aspect right. that would fit in, yeah. you know, the way this catalog was structured. Okay, mm. we have, I think, time for just a couple more questions. So we had Ed, and I see Janine there. Um, do people want to comment? Mm. Make a question? Uh, Janine Salino, independent curator. Uh, I was just wanted to go back to the installation uh, next door and wondered whether you originally had planned to install the entire floor, uh, or were you, or was that one half your original plan? I don't know where Caroline is uh, and the, the students. Uh, I wondered if there were a lot of things that you found, or not very many things. Curious about that too. Well, originally the um, 
the show was going to be on the very top floor in a smaller room. But I think there was some decision to not have the other big show that was supposed to be at the same time. So we actually um, got a slightly larger space. Oh, that's you or me. <laughs> Uh, as gallery director, why don't you address this? <laughs> 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 you just being director of the Bright in the gallery. Actually, it was a, a very conscious and important choice because we, well, part of it has to do with various administrative matters within the Bright Gardens Center, but we were eager to give more prominence to focus projects. These two, in a way, are a legacy of the first model, so they were originally intended to be in the smaller room. And rather than trying to stretch them out, we kept them within the scale that they were originally intended. And this is part of a long-term project that we will now, every spring, actually feature two focus project exhibitions. Um, and I, I should also say that focus project exhibitions are, have a budget cap. Um, so the curators are asked to work within that budget cap for both getting loans and for doing their publication. So those limitations continue to apply even though it's special. Understood. So uh, did you so find a lot? Well there is a lot, a, but um, I have to say there? coming and the way of entry to that is through the catalog and that was one thing that that we were doing in, in working with the checklist. But we you know the students were very much involved in developing the checklist. And it wasn't just about the stuff, it was very much about the experience, the souvenirs the kind of culture that developed around it. So we were very much honoring those concepts. And at the same time wanting to, you know, convey some of that, you know, that sense of what was the material that was in the fair. But we didn't want to overbalance it either. We wanted to keep it within but certainly there is stuff out there. And the way to find it is through is through the catalogs and through the illustrations. In fact the Puto that's on view is illustrated in Silliman and that's and that illustration is a full page spread. And to get to your point about the big arrow types, um, the the pictures of the elements for that sideboard were actually photographed in the in Ernst Posman studio. And they're in different configure I mean it's the putos are together with a little um, architectural detail between them, not how they're actually on on the cabinet, which we have to build a lot of that. And so you know, it really became a question of balance and you know, uh, and keeping to that, I will say, for a small exhibition, we have 13 members, which is quite a lot. <laughs> made, uh, made things yeah. very interesting, especially with the same story and inspiration. Um, yeah. so I'd just like to add that I'm quite pleased by the fact that we've never gone over budget on a <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I, I think we can continue, continue this discussion at our reception outside. And uh, I wanted to thank Laura Minsky, our special events director, for doing such a wonderful job putting this uh, symposium together. And I also wanted to thank by name the students who worked on the exhibition, um, some of whom are here, and, but many who are not, and that's Clara Bosch, Alexander Busher. Roberta Gorin, Anna Estrades, Maggie Frick, Sheila Maloney, Elizabeth Muir, Rebecca Stadler, Laura Schilling, Alyssa Vasquez, Caroline O'Connell, Andrew Taggart, Garrett Swanson, Jessica Kitts. And I also wanted to um, say a special thanks to David's family, um, who's joined us for this occasion. And that's his cousin, Stephen Beth, and his very dear daughter, Isadora. Thank you.